<laughs> ah, you went uh you went briefly mute when you started recording but i think it was ah. just the initial thing <laughs> oh yes. let's hope so ah. let's hope yeah. so i am um, <laughs> i'm rendering another chat that i had uh, uh about a week ago with kit um mm. we're doing a series on um we're breaking down uh barker's books of blood mm. and we're doing mm. them story by story it's uh it's really fascinating because kit's never read them before yeah, I've only read like some of them. I really need. I mean, I really need to read a Magica at some point. It's, oh uh, my yeah. god! It's, like, it's one Mag- of like Jeez. been on my uh, to read list way too long. It's a big um, one, though. I mean, I I will yeah. I will say that it's it's re it's just so dense in terms of mm. its ideas, and I mean, it's big as well. I mean, it's huge that book. It's it's an enormous piece of work, but mm. it's it's just the amount of ideas that the man plays with. I mean, like in in Magica, Barker basically tries to create an entire metaphysics out of everything he believes or thinks or has ever belie- believed or thought and it's incredible it, it's yeah. it's it's stunning i mean it's it, he plays with more ideas in that book than most authors will do in their entire lifetimes in their entire careers yeah yeah no i mean i i i i from what i've heard about it it sounds like a book i'll absolutely adore when i well, actually yes uh, we've yeah. got um, we've got jack reading it jack graham's reading it and um mm. he's very much enjoying it it's really fascinating i mean he um he he made us laugh because he was reading it and he 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 was only a, like it wasn't very far through, and he went, "Oh, it's about cycles, isn't it?" And I was, and Kit and I just fell about. We were like, "Um, yes, <laughs> very, very, very." The the fact that he got it that early on, and mm-hmm. he's so right on on levels that he can't even begin to understand yet. <laughs> mm-hmm. It really made us smile. Really made us smile. But the books of blood are fascinating because Barker wrote them when he was it was in his early 30s he was basically down and out you know he was living in london he was living in a squat with lots of other people who would interestingly for the most part go on to become quite successful and famous themselves so people like paul o'grady um mm. les dennis <laughs> believe mm. it or not <laughs> There, there's uh, always this like historical confluence of the same people in those in the in like a specific genre as well right. like yeah i mean like, like i mean the, the sort of ultimate story of the sort of uh um mary shelley and, and et al writing the um yeah like it's yeah you, you do find that occurs a lot i guess these cross pollinations i suppose yeah. it is and at that point of course none of them had big careers or i mean this was thatcherite britain they're all creative so they're all on the dole they were living in this squat they're all very impecunious and um barker wrote these stories and they got published and they became rather successful and on the back of that of course he got he wrote hellraiser and the rest is history his life literally changed overnight Mm. really Mm. bizarre such a strange story um because he i mean he and you can see his experience of 1980s london in the books of blood there's such it's so, it's so interesting to read barker of that era and then compare and contrast to something like imagica for example mm-hmm. because the, the as dark as imagica gets there is a kind of utopianism inherent to imagica whereas there just isn't in the books of blood yeah the books of blood are, are just cynicism through and through that there is even like a nihilism in yeah. most of them I mean, it's london stuff generally right because like even like the first hellraiser film has that like psychogeography of nihilism yeah so, that is london isn't it hellraiser pretty much, one. Like, yeah, pretty yeah, much. Yeah. i know I th- is, it, is it london or is it i think it is london y- y- yes I, I always get confused whether it's london or liverpool because i think the reason being the book the hellbound heart is set in liverpool which is of course mm. barker's hometown um but i i believe the film is indeed london yeah it's a suburb of london mm. 
has that feel to it, as I, as I recall. But yeah, I mean, there's a real sense of place in that film that, that's quite impressive, um, given well, everything about that film is impressive, given the budget and, right, and I the know, resources. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I didn't realize until I got the uh, the DVDs. Someone bought me for a birthday when I was at university. They bought me the Lament configuration DVD set, which mm. is great. It's got Hellraiser one, two, and sadly three, um, but it's also got all of these wonderful documentaries on it about the making of the film and where it came from and originally it was going to be an art house film i mean it was going to be very 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 low budget indeed it was being funded by what was then the sort of creative council of liverpool you know the film council of liverpool um which doesn't exist anymore obviously <laughs> after many many decades of tory cuts to the arts of course it doesn't <laughs> exist um, but barker and his team got a little bit of budget from them and it was originally i believe something like like originally it was going to be something like forty thousand pounds which is of course even back then was nothing yeah just yeah the tiniest budget but it did manage to get the attention of uh, what was then new line cinema um and they injected much more cash into it. i mean even even the final budget it wasn't significant it was i think it was like ninety thousand something like that um which is pittance it's it's, mm. it's 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 a pitiful amount of money for it to make a film on um but of course as a result of that they managed to do all of the more interesting special effects shots and just expand it a little bit and of course it also got a a a cinematic release as a result of all of that as well yeah yeah i mean like it's really interesting watching the sort of films of of that era i think like the sam Raimi films as well where oh. Like having like a decent budget, like more than like a typical student film would have, mm -hmm. but then having also those limits plays into the quality of the film so much. Absolutely, um, yeah. there's a, there's like a uh, certainly the horror of that era where so much of it is independent. I mean, it's it's the John Carpenter approach, isn't it? I mean, like Halloween, Halloween, uh, late 1970s, no budget at all to speak of, like nothing, and certainly no mm -hmm. backing from major studios of any kind. All of Carpenter's team were they were just out of film school very like sam raimi um and that does it does lend them a certain punkish rawness doesn't it you know they come in and they they change the landscape of what horror cinema was at the time mm -hmm. and barker of course had no background in cinema at all like nothing they didn't had no idea what he was doing by his own admission <laughs> on the first shoot of hellraiser had a lot a great team around him and yeah a lot of help you know a lot of help and uh, a, a real vision of what he mm. wanted the film to be i mean that's the thing like i think that combination that barker has of humility and vision definitely plays into his favor when he gets coming to new mediums and he does that obviously a lot because he did it mm -hmm. with gaming as well as film of course um and of course, the like the the absolutely devastating combination is like somebody who has no vision and is incredibly arrogant, or more commonly, I guess, people who do have a vision but are incredibly arrogant. Oh goodness, um, isn't it just? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, like that that happens an awful. I mean, I think like all of the um, bad earlier Star Wars films and sort of mm. the uh, yeah. Oh um, my goodness! Not understanding the medium definitely comes into place it's, to some degree it's like the bombast um, of those of those films is incredible it's it's I, you can be quite hypersensitive to it can't you like it, it feels like those films are shouting at you yeah that's what i yeah. find anyway it's, it's like it's the michael bay thing whenever yeah. i'm in front of a michael bay film and it only happens by accident these days but whenever <laughs> i am i feel like i'm being shouted at or like i'm being assaulted you know it's not uh, it's not a pleasant thing i think people like misconstrue like the ways he's bad as well because i think like most people see him as just this sort of purely mercenary director and actually i i will kind of call him an auteur he definitely has like an aesthetic that runs through his movie and he has like ideas yes. and the message it's just they're not very good it's just messages. bad that's it that's it exactly <laughs> they're just bad ideas that's yeah. that's the thing but he is you are right you are absolutely right because he's so distinct isn't he i mean you you know a michael bay film the moment yeah. it's on you know it i mean you can't help it because they're so damn loud and, <laughs> and fast and there's so much going on i mean the the action in michael mm. bay films is atrocious even the way that it's choreographed is very somehow very distinct to him like it's not it's it's not quite like the silliness of say like like bollywood action or something no. or or the 
Um, and it, it isn't like that kind of like, it's not that kind of, um, oh, who's the guy who directed the um, ultra serious Batman films, you know, the Dark Knight. And oh, Batman Nolan. Games. Yeah, it's not got that sort of like, like um, toned down mellowness of a Nolan film, mm-hmm. which is also like hyper violent and actually yeah. and like, but there's a kind of like, there's something like in between those two worlds, like this, it's kind of colorful, but also grim at the same time. It's really strange, isn't it? It's it's, it's yeah. like the, the tonal inconsistency is really a problem in a lot of base films, especially when he his recent milieu, which is of course taking 1980s children's cartoon franchises and turning them into films. Mm. And the, the inconsistency, the incongruity of that, the fact that these franchises are ultimately aimed at children, but he injects these very, well, they're not even adult, they're puerile, they're more like adolescent like teenage jokes and schoolyard humor into them Mm. it just doesn't work no no it's it well it's because it's in congress like it's a it's a children's franchise that you've then just got a sort of like almost like american pie style level of humor like that's exactly it it. that's exactly it so you've got like the innate silliness of the concept whatever it is, whether it's the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or whether it's the Transformers or whatever. And then married to that, you have the kind of humor you'd expect to find in a a realist 1990s comedy, like a stoner comedy. Yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it, it's just bizarre. It's just bizarre. I mean, I think tonal like inconsistencies can work if they're deliberate, but the problem with mm. Michael Bay is I don't think he has that level of no. self-awareness. Oh, God, no. And also, <laughs> he just doesn't care. I no. just don't think he cares. There is this element of him, you know, he knows whereof he does. I mean, he makes money. That's definitely true. Yeah. His movies make bank, and boy, do they. I believe, like, the original Transformers film was just enormous when it came out. It was one of the highest-grossing films ever when it first came out. Um, so he knows what he's doing in that regard, and he knows how to how to make bank at the box office. But that does not necessarily a good film make. Yes, I mean for better and worse, uh, usually worse. Like every author now has to have that quality of making ridiculous amounts of money because otherwise they wouldn't be tolerated. Yeah, um, I know, and, right? and I guess he's like the archetype of the most tolerable kind of author now because yeah, he 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 does appeal to people like like whatever else yeah i mean not not to be too snobbish about it but it is that old sort of the lowest common denominator isn't it his his films are they're offensive Mm. in particular ways but they're offensive in a way that appeals to pervasive prejudices and bigotries so that's why they please people you know the i mean the incredible racism in the transformers films is unbelievable Mm. it's the kind of sort of black and white minstrel stuff that you would expect to have gone the way of the dodo back in the 1980s at at the latest it's awful Mm, mm. i mean it's amazing how much of that stuff like it just gets sort of allocated to its own specific zone where people who would be annoyed by it don't really even engage with it except to dismiss it anyway so like (laughs) yeah it's not really going to um it's not really going to get a backlash lately like, like, no yeah. not in the same way i mean i suppose in its own peculiar way and, and i i have no doubt this is entirely by accident it is faithful to, in its own bizarre way to the source material because a lot of these 1980s children's cartoons were sort of the last bastions of racist tropes and stereotypes from from comedy you know mm. I, mean, I mean i guess it, uh, sorry no no, no go on I was, I was just going to say, I mean, I guess they're kind of products of neoliberalism in like a direct way because like, they, yeah, the, the whole thing of using um, cartoons to sell children's toys was a wow. direct product of um, of the Reagan-Thatcher consensus of course. and the rules they created course. around television. Yeah. Um, and that sort of like inherent, slightly fascistic politics that... Uh, I think only really um, grim dark actually noticed was at the core of neoliberalism at the time. <laughs> um, it, I always like the idea of the left playing catch up to sort of grim dark media. Um, oh, that is funny, <laughs> isn't it? That is very, yeah. because a lot there is um there is a very strange discourse going on at the moment where there is an almost like a a, a serious puritanism arising from certain areas of the left. So we we've noticed this in um, in horror fiction. 
Mm. As particularly in LGBTQ horror fiction, which of course, you know, we're quite immersed in, where people we're we're being taken to task for including certain subjects or using certain tropes or concepts in our fiction so Mm. it's like you can't i mean this is what the book of queer saints was was conceived as a reaction to this notion that all lgbtq characters have to be saintlier than saintly they have to be Mm. purer than the driven snow that you cannot have ambiguous interesting or even contentious or antagonistic lgbtq characters otherwise it's it's accounted as being as being somehow homophobic you know or transphobic or whatever and that's really bizarre that's Mm. really bizarre we it's almost like you you are prohibited from exploring the true humanity and experience of being lgbtq you know um and that's what the book of queer saints was a reaction to it's the fact that we we wanted to create stories where the the true experience of of being what we are is explored in fiction without parameter so what Mm. people might preconceive as the negative and the positive together you know I mean, just not being able to talk about those things is has always been a feature of the sort of censoriousness arrayed against it. So, like, I think about, like, the Hayes Code in, mm-hmm. in the US, and, and obviously it had an impact everywhere. Um, like, one of the things about the Hayes Code is, it, and this is very specific to the misogynistic element of it rather than mm-hmm. the homophobic element of it, um, is that it, it created rules about how you could depict women in terms of them being evil. And essentially, it said you can't. You're not allowed to depict women as evil. Um, and there's like, <laughs> there's like a scene at the end of one of the Superman films where there's like a there's a whole bunch of kryptonites, you know, and the General mm-hmm. Zog or whatever it is. And one of them's a woman. Yeah. Um, and just her alone, as she's being sort of cast out into space, I think Superman throws them into space in a typically cartoon this fashion uh-huh. um you just kind of vaguely hear her say like i'm sorry it comes out of nowhere <laughs> like nothing in their cat and it's just like to fit the haze code because she <laughs> can't be completely evil to fit oh. the haze code so oh. she has to apologize she has to have like this one <laughs> redeeming feature and That's, then like oh it's so dehumanizing yeah. isn't it it's so dehumanizing and it's something that has rippled down the the decades since then because we still see that of course i mean we've seen a massive resurgence of that very particular masked kind of misogyny in a lot of mainstream fiction recently things like for i mean really good examples are the current live action remakes of things like disney films for example particularly the ones that have a female antagonist right so maleficent is is a great example of this maleficent in the um in the film the angelina jolie film maleficent cannot be an evil entity on her own in her own right she has to be acting in reaction to a man <laughs> yes yeah and it's that's so always like right yeah. i mean it gets even more so like i gather that the re- I'm, i may be wrong but i think i'm right and i'm judging from the advert because i wouldn't watch the movie mm-hmm. is that in the origin story for cruella de vil it turns out that the reason she hates dalmatians is because these really bad CGI Dalmatian dogs knocked her mother off a um, off like a, a, a ledge into the ocean oh, and killed her. Is that, it, like oh, that's like the origin of her deep seated rage her against name Dalmatian. Is Cruella de Vil. <laughs> I mean, like, that was just a coincidence. It was the Dalmatians killing her mother in a very deliberate fashion. Um, Like, it's beyond parody. It is beyond parody, isn't it? I mean, you just can't. It's so ridiculous, isn't it? And it Mm. does, I find it undermines the purity of these characters to to the nth degree. I mean, the thing about Maleficent, if you watch the original Sleeping Beauty cartoon, she's just elemental evil, as her name suggests, and is wonderful as a result. She's compelling because of that. There is a an incredible purity to her, which is wonderful to behold. Cruella de Vil in the original 101 Dalmatians, really wonderful, just wonderful, yeah. just a, a, a very unpleasant, evil, materialistic character, mm. just wonderful to behold, you know? You yeah. don't need this. We don't need an origin and backstory and justification for everything. I and mean, the thing is, if, if you want to critique those things, that's fine in itself, but it's just not 
a critique what's being yeah. offered isn't a critique because they're not engaging with the actual character so if you want to critique the idea of um archetypal evil femininity mm. the sort of world destroying feminine etc there are plenty Absolutely. of interesting stories to tell about that but by making her just essentially a domestic abuse victim yes that's that's not that story it's 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 just robbing her of her archetypal power it's robbing yep. her of herself so fundamentally that you're not really saying anything about maleficent anymore nope. or about the original material and like similar for quality well which i don't think he's even an originally problematic character to be honest so that no, makes even she's, less sense she's, she's just a, a a materialist isn't she she's a she's yeah. rich she's a narcissist she's a materialist she that's basically it you don't really yeah. need anything else at all and yeah, i love the I'm, way the elegance of the introduction of the character you don't need anything you know who she is you know mm. what she is just by her framing by the, the the design of her the way she moves it's really like a beautiful exercise in animation and in visual yeah. storytelling you do not need these lab Boreous flashbacks, backstories, which I I, I, t I tell you not a word of a lie. Every single one of the live action remakes of the Disney films does. Every single one of them does it. The 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 arch the arch enemy in this regard is the Beauty and the Beast remake. <laughs> it's yeah, awful. I've, I've it's heard bad awful. things. <laughs> Every and I, I, everyone has their tragic backstory. Every single character has their tragic backstory. The sorceress who curses the castle at the beginning and turns everyone into furniture and the prince into a beast has her tragic backstory. Gaston, Gaston, <laughs> who you don't need again, like Cruella de Vil, you know who he is just yeah. by, in the original film, you know who he is just by his framing and the way he interacts with the other characters. Again, he's a narcissist, he's a misogynist, yeah. he believes everyone around him is his property, and that's all you need to know. That's mm. all you need to know. The live action remake goes into this ham fisted, laborious dilution of his character mm. where it tries to explain oh he was in a war and he has ptsd and it's like, i don't care mm. I, I mean like, don't the thing care. is it doesn't matter that much even if it's true because like this comes at a fundamental problem i think a lot of this media has with not just like the villainy of the oppressed the idea that the press could have enough agency to be morally complicated mm -hmm. but they're also just villainy per se yeah. and i think it comes from this fundamental sense which i think has become very common in narrative fiction that complexity in and of itself that that sort of more complexity is an excuse and i just think that that's wrong like I think like probably somebody like Adolf Hitler had a lot of moral complexity. <laughs> he probably did have an abusive childhood. I gather there's evidence of that. He probably had traumatizing experiences that led to mm -hmm. his prejudices. And at a fundamental level, it just doesn't matter. Just if doesn't you can't matter, right? if you can't judge um Adolf Hitler, no matter what complexity you assign him, then you've lost the ability to judge anything. Absolutely, you are and, you are by, by definition morally insane, right? Yeah, yeah. You just you just haven't got a, a way of evaluating the world in moral terms anymore because <laughs> like everything just becomes. Uh, a, a matter of nuance and complexity like nuances exist but they're not in a moral excuse as long as we have agency the that's nuances it. in themselves cannot be a moral excuse like that's they can it. be it's, in it's, specifics but like right. not in totality you can examine yeah. the phenomena without using it as a justification right and examining the phenomena is a good thing and it's a good thing for fiction to do absolutely it is but none of these examples are doing that none yeah. of them are doing that it's it's so boardroom it's so written by committee edited by test audience you know it's just there to give the patina of complexity it's not sincere it's not genuine and it does nothing a for the characters it does nothing for them other than dilute them and it does nothing for the wider stories either because very often these stories are mythic or folkloric and the mm. archetypes exist for a reason I mean, yeah. it's even more complex with regards to the Disney Beauty and the Beast, because when you look at the context of the original animated film, it, it, that, that film occurred directly after the incredible success of The Little Mermaid, the film that saved the studio. 
Mm. You know, Disney at that point was foundering. It was just on the very edge of liquidation. And The Little Mermaid proved a phenomenal worldwide success reinvigorated the company and they immediately came out with beauty and the beast when you watch beauty and the beast it's really interesting because it is the inverse of the little mermaid Mm. almost every archetype that's presented in the little mermaid is inverted in beauty and the beast gaston even looks like prince eric but buffed up and bloated up and the dynamic between gaston and Belle is the it's almost like the, the mirror darkly version of the relationship between ariel and eric it's really quite clever in that regard when you regard them both together but by introducing these quote-unquote complexities all of that is undone all of that interesting disney kind of poking fun at itself trying mm. to almost lampoon itself is gone it's just yeah. gone i mean ultimately if disney sort of founds itself on these archetypal stories i mean basically like mythology and fairy tale and fairy tales are like in a really rudimentary way like moral stories they're, they're stories <laughs> of like really simple morality often in effect from very reactionary i mean you know through the 19th century obviously that that <laughs> lens very reactionary uh, very... lenses um and um and and mythos these are like they, they kind of have elements of fairy tales but they're broader and they're about like how do we come to be what is the nature of the world and mm -hmm. like maleficent is like that she is like archetypal nature against humanity she's mm -hmm. the sort of force of um of sort of nature personified as this vengeful narcissistic spirit yeah she's um, like elemental yeah. evil isn't she? she's fairly yeah. evil i suppose in that regard mythic yeah and she, and she's I mean at a fundamental level she's like about you know how humanity deals with a natural world that is often hostile to it mm -hmm. um so like humanizing her just kind of misses the point anyway like yeah. like if you wanted to do something morally complex then you, you'd probably want to talk about like relationships to the natural world you want to do mm -hmm. something even like ecological maybe yeah um but like yeah just humanizing her just misses her and then like yeah like with um Quella de Ville, she's more of a fairy tale villain. She she she's there to convey a point about selfishness and mm -hmm. materiality and greed. Um, that the other characters, the little lovely couple who are yeah. kind of, like pointedly contrasted with her, and then yeah. the dogs, and you know, they all have like more complexities that they have to sort of work from. I mean, that's very much their journey. Um, you know, that that that's 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 her point. Like she represents the bad that they have to not embody. That's um, exactly it. That is exactly it. Because of course, I mean, she's also a temptator as well. I mean, she offers to buy the puppies. There's almost yeah. like a, a Mephistophelian Faustian thing going on here as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you like you think about those sort of fairy tales where like like the the three brothers will go out and the old the two will will um, behave terribly as they face temptation mm -hmm. and always take the wrong one, and then the younger sort of downcast one will will take the sort of harder path and be consistently rewarded for it yes. eventually. Um, and like it's a, it's always a weird message because it's always kind of still very egotistical because it's basically like oh he's actually the, because it's invariably him that mm. the younger one is just like he's just wise enough to know that this is like egotistically the better course to take right right like, yeah it's not, it's not really even that altruistic like like, no. like he just knows giving to the beggar uh, along the road is ultimately going to work out for him whereas his brothers are, are just silly enough not to realize that like <laughs> that beggar is probably a god uh, and is going to severely punish them probably in a, in a way too excessive for absolutely um, yes for there the is a crime of like there is a tendency yeah. for like the the e the wicked sisters or stepmother or the the evil brothers to be really horribly punished in those stories yeah. usually mutilated in some way yes. or, or like throw you know they're cast into a well forevermore or something awful like that mm. They always end up in like a position of like of like destitution and humiliation. Like it's yeah. like, yeah, their, their lives could not be worse. <laughs> um, it, and it's like, and their crime is like they didn't give the free gold coins to the first beggar they saw. That's exactly <laughs> it. That is exactly it. Uh, they're, they're punished for like being rude, ultimately, aren't they? Yes. But they're punished with, like, almost Dantean 
mm. visions of hell. It's a very, um, oh, uh, uh, Hannibal Lecter form of morality. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it is. I suppose it is. Yeah, you were rude, so I'm going to make something artistic and grotesque out of you. <laughs> yeah, that is that is essentially it, yeah. Like, <laughs> thinking of segueing somehow into um, into Elden Ring. But, into uh, Elden Ring, well, oh yeah. my goodness. I mean, I'm, I'm intimidated about in talking about Elden Ring, if I'm quite honest. I mean, it is intimidating, because like, the, the mythos is enormous like, it's just, enormous like, isn't it i mean yeah. it, it not only is it enormous but it, in that typical from soft style it's communicated in that very impressionistic manner so yeah. it's very difficult to make absolute statements about it one way or the other um Absolutely, and, uh, yeah. because of the nature of the world as well i mean the way uh, you can do this in the other games in dark souls and bloodborne you can miss elements of the mythology really easily like you don't see something in the environment you don't see a particular reaction of one of the enemy sprites that would suggest something and suddenly the mythos is different here it's even more enormous Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, like in terms of like missing stuff, some of the stuff is because I, you know, obviously watched a lot of videos after completing mm -hmm. it, so I can go get, get more. Um, and like some of the stuff is so incredibly subtle. Like, like uh, one of my favorite examples is um, the the witch village you find with all of the dancing yes. witches who don't attack you, and and that's like just the most one of the most fantastic places. They're worshiping one of those um, god killer oh, type the god skin, skin guys. Yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and and it's kind of like the, the whole relationship to to him and and what else is going on. They've clearly um, butchered this group of nobles, and you find the noble outfit um, in that fireplace in the village nearby. Mm -hmm. But then there's also there's also all these flowers all over the place, um, and and there's a particular architecture of that place which is quite unique. Um, and then you go a little further on, um, and it's where you find. Um, uh, you find a whole bunch of these. Uh, are they called abhumans? Yeah, I think they're called abhumans. Oh, like, the demi-humans. Uh, yeah. Demi yes. yeah. And you find a whole bunch of them um, in this other village. Um, it's quite a distance away, but it, there's clear like road link between it and the mm -hmm. witch's village. Um, and it has one of the witches in that village, and she's just dead on the doorstep. And then there's like there's architectural similarities. Um, and there's kind of just as these suggestions that this is used to be where they were located and that they were displaced by the demi humans mm -hmm. and sort of relocated um, to this um, other place where they destroyed this sort of human settlement. Um, and they've got like, you know, if you read their, their, their equipment and stuff, they've got all of this stuff suggesting that they were all kind of once these a perpetually youthful beautiful women mm -hmm. um that have been sort of corrupted um you know perhaps through worshipping whatever the hell that thing is yes. whatever they are can't the, be oh. can't be healthy to worship those no <laughs> um, no um, they they certainly have a patina of i mean it's such a difficult thing to say in elden ring isn't it i mean you you, you would say uh, traditionally certainly in any traditional fantasy that they are antagonistic they're evil that they, they are elementally evil and even their name the god skin nobles you you would think that they would be bad guys but it's very difficult to state that with any certainty in elden ring i mean there's a kind of just a lack of any moral center to this world because yep. as you get to know it more and more and this is obviously typical of from soft games mm -hmm. it, it just shows that every single truth that you're told is just a lie built on yeah. a lie built on a lie it's all corrupt um, isn't it everything is yeah. corrupt the metaphysics any and any metaphysics you can draw in this world and that that's a key point i think in this in this particular universe is innately corrupt and there are some characters that acknowledge that there yeah. are some characters that acknowledge that and build that into what their vision of whatever world they want to bring about like the dung eater for example mm. Um, he, he's got this strange, almost like a, a bizarre utopianism about him when you, when he actually tells you what his vision of the future is. I mean, he tells you flat out, it doesn't matter what you do, mm. whatever metaphysics you create, or even if you patch the Elden Ring back together, it's all going to come down eventually. So why not create a situation where everything changes why not rot the entirety of the metaphysics and see what's born at the very end of it all mm. i mean he's uh, in the end i mean i think that the ending 
um, that you get through him, which is one of the more disturbing, I mean, there's a whole bunch of very disturbing <laughs> endings, um, is, is a kind of almost um, sort of Nurgle universe of like perpetual yeah. um, decay, but also like a kind of cyclical universe. So I guess <laughs> it's that sort of, yeah, it's a universe sort of born of perpetual disease and rot and then renewal and then rot and disease mm-hmm. again. Yeah. So um, he's acknowledging the entropy of that yeah. metaphysics. It's, it's really I mean, fascinating. He kind of almost make, he kind of almost is tearing down the sort of superficial appearances of a universe that isn't like that and just like this is just what the universe yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he's not entirely wrong, is he? I mean, that seems to be almost fundamentally correct. I mean, you've also got things like Rani's ending as well, the Age of Stars. And mm. characters like Rani, they seem to have acknowledge that again there's if you follow your predestined or prescribed path if you just follow what the engine prescribes then it's all just going to happen again everything's just going to continue in the way it always has and the same cataclysms are going to play out maybe with slightly different motifs maybe the world will be a slightly different shape but dynamically it will be the same and the only way the only way of escaping it is by drawing your own Mm. that seems to be what rani is doing which i think i think is probably the best way to go to be honest i think yeah i mean rani's ending is is definitely my favorite not least because her plot line is just amazing oh isn't it great playing through it is like a pleasure it's so easy to miss as well or to miss like the the important moments like if you don't find uh uh, the wolf guy at blythe i think his name is at particular points in the Mm. game then it stops you can't yeah. beat it. Yeah, I'm blithe. Oh god, what a tragic character! <laughs> oh, I was so yeah, sad. Yeah. yeah, I was so sad when you had to end. I, I just, I was very, very upset at having to. I mean, I understand the justification actually, um, mm. because he's ultimately like an elemental spirit bound to Rani, isn't he? Yeah, well, and, he's a facet of her, of her particular. Um, oh, what do they call them? The the sort of ones who have that ability to to reorder the world. There's a sort oh, of name for there it. is a particular um, term, isn't there? I can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Yeah, but like 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 when they come to fruition, they gain these wolf spirits, which are kind of part of them. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess the animalistic side of themselves. Um, but it's also the part of them, it's it's designed to maintain duty, isn't it? They're, they're meant to keep yeah. them on a very particular path to fulfill yeah. whatever purpose they were born for. And when she breaks that, when she defies that and becomes something else, it mm-hmm. kind of corrupts Oh, it makes him feel oh, i was so sad yeah. i was no, so no, he sad. is a very tragic character mostly because he's really one of the very few likable characters he's quite in decent the isn't game. He? Yeah. he's quite decent yeah. you know yeah. the internet loves him yes as yeah. you'd expect I'm... the internet's really taken to actually all the characters in rani's little cohort eji's lovely too yeah well there's one Clearing exception. Yes, um, yes. He's Preceptor Silvaris is not... Um... No, he's a complete <laughs> dick, isn't he? He's just a complete dick from beginning to end. Yes. And everything about him, like even when you uncover the secrets about him, he's a bad guy, isn't he? It's never surprising with him as well, because like no. from the moment you meet him, you just know that he's up to something terrible. Well, and it's like, yeah, he is. <laughs> he doesn't even try to hide it. Does yeah. that's what I like. He like he just yeah. treats you with utter contempt from the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he is he is by far the most. <laughs> I mean, like like in a game which includes patches, he manages mm-hmm. to be one of the most loathsome. Probably not the most loathsome, because I will always give that reward to uh, Gideon Offnir. Yeah, um, because yeah. of his very particular relationship with uh, Latena and mm-hmm. and um, oh, uh, what's his daughter called? Something Lou, oh, Nefalilu. Yes. Uh, Nefalilu? Yeah, yeah. She, she's. Um, I mean, he basically is. Um, yeah, he's a bastard. Like he, yeah, is he, he really like, is, isn't yeah. he? I mean, he's totally. Yeah. All he cares about is function, isn't it? That's all he cares about. Continuing yeah. the cycles. That's it. Mm. Just continuing everything as it is it's like Arr! no dislike him Sauromir, as i've called him yes yeah it's, it's, it turned out to be more apt than you would be <laughs> yeah, I, know, right? uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I think he was also like i think there's like suggestions that he might be responsible for the sort of genociding of the albanerics mm-hmm. and yeah like all kinds i mean obviously he 
kills um, poor uh, Latena's wolf, which is yeah. vile. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 I mean, he's like, I, I guess he's kind of the opposite of, of Gowry, who's another like interesting enigmatic figure that like you meet, um, you meet him and you kind of think, oh, he's like curmudgeonly but on your side and he's like mm-hmm. a mentor figure. Um, whereas you meet Gary and think like like he is just up to like terrible nefarious mm-hmm. things, and it actually turns out he's like one of the most decent. Right, um, turns out he's fine. Yeah. Right, it turns yeah. out that he's actually on the level. He sounds like he isn't. He re- and yeah. he looks like he isn't. He reminds me a little bit of the um, the character in Bloodborne who's in the chapel, the 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 little gangrel priest guy, mm. who looks and sounds like he is up to no good, but is actually the only character in that game who is totally on the level. Yeah. <laughs> no, he, yeah, it's it's like like that's a I mean it's a trope within FromSoft games. Definitely. Do, Definitely. Do you know? Um, do you know what Gary is? Because he, if you attack him um, and kill him, he turns into one of those um, centipede type um, disease worshipping creatures. He is one of those. Like, oh like, right! I, yeah. I did not know that. I've never attacked him. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I only know that from videos. I didn't personally attack him because so he is no... actually like. A, so in that case, I mean, those creatures are born from the rot, aren't they? They're yes. born from the, um, the the scarlet rot. So, but he clearly isn't like aligned with. I mean, he talks very dismi- disdainfully of of them right. at least one point, I think, and and he he obviously. I mean, they all kind of worship Mil- Millicent because she's kind of a creature of the rot. Yeah, she's the, um, the mother of the rot, isn't she, technically? Yeah, I mean, because she's an extension of, um, oh, what's her name? The, the sort of sword woman. Um, yeah, who's like the hardest boss in the game. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> possibly, I, I mean, she is. A, she's a nightmare, isn't she? I've, I actually found most of Elden Ring easier to tackle than most of the other from soft mm. games but she wow i needed no, I, help i, I need dealt help. with I, I dealt with her right away of help and she wasn't a challenge because of that. <laughs> because you had help but, yeah. <laughs> but i was like i knew she was like had a reputation i wasn't gonna spend like five hours fighting her, so i just like <laughs> immediately summoned as many people as i could and, yeah um and the people who want to be summoned around her are very well equipped for beating oh, yes. her so oh, uh, yes. they, they know what yeah. they're doing for the most part definitely <laughs> i mean like i i almost felt like i was obstructing them like whenever yeah. i came in to like launch an attack so i i, I felt the same them. way um, when i did rykard i summoned two other players for that fight mm. and uh, in the end i kind of just backed off and let them get on with it because they clearly had done the fight before i managed rykard kind of okay like it's always weird like some bosses like other people say are really hard and, and mm. i found easy and some bosses that i find like excruciatingly hard other people i remember uh, i haven't had time to watch your lot let's plays recently but when i was watching them more frequently um i saw like you take on a lot of bosses that i like really struggled with and like you just beat them like, like nothing <laughs> and then like there were other bosses which i mm-hmm. found like pitifully easy which you kind of and that's just like character build and yeah. style and that's like the beauty of these games that like the way you play it will just vastly change I know, your, your right? particular I think, experience yeah i think elden ring in particular just warrants yeah. replaying i mean the problem is the size of it is it? I mean, and that's not. I mean, I say it's a problem. It's not. It's it's absolutely wonderful. But I've 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 kind of been ruined by this game. Mm. I, I mean, I don't know what else can possibly stand up. I eventually I'd installed it after beating it like a few times, but like um, 311 hours. I'm just checking now. Yeah, 311 <laughs> hours is a an impressive amount for me to spend on one game. Yeah, space. absolutely. Um, I can't I can't think of another game in recent history apart from maybe Bloodborne, which again another mm-hmm. FromSoft game has yeah. exercised that degree of fascination for me. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's so much is rooted in the story and the place and the way that that's conveyed through the gameplay. And it is just such an entrancing world. Like, like the world is just fascinating. You oh, could, it's you could beautiful. Write, you, could, you could do a whole podcast just about like a minor inconsequential character. You could do a podcast about Iron Fist Alexander, for yeah. example. Like, yeah. like, like there's enough to say about him, just him and his whole arc and the sort of like him going from like comic relief to sad mm-hmm. corruption story to like, oh, you, you know, again. you're eventually having to put him down, which oh. kind of felt like inevitable from, from the beginning. It, but it like... is, isn't it? You kind of know what's going to happen, <laughs> but 
it still makes me sad. I didn't want to do it. <laughs> For any of the characters that, like actually define your ending, like Melina and Fear and Rihanna, um, like uh, all of those characters, you could you could do like a series of podcasts on like. Oh, they're so you could, complex, yeah. aren't yeah. they? Morgoth and what? Oh yeah. my goodness, yeah. he was beautiful. Mm. No, yeah, he was, I, yeah. Oh, I loved him so much. He died. I actually, I, I, I killed him really quickly. <laughs> and mm. someone put in the comments afterwards, "You, that's one of the hardest bosses in the game. You've just got a really weird build that, for some reason, worked <laughs> against him." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, the whole thing with the um, they're not called ogres, are they? Uh, are they called ogres? No, they're like called. The, yeah. um, oh. What are they called? Omens. Omens. Omens yes. Called. Yeah. The omen. The the omen brothers. I mean, they're fascinating and tragic, and 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 the whole relationship um, between them and the way that they take these. I mean, essentially, they're like the ultimate downcast and yeah. outcast. Um, and you have this like again, it's like this wonderful, almost fairy tale symmetry between them because one of them deals with that by becoming the ultimate sort of utopian rebel like mm-hmm. he's going to create an order of outcasts his his approach to that is like well fuck the golden order and fuck yeah. anything that comes out of it i'm just going to create my own thing and it's <laughs> going to be this sort of like uh, you know and he obviously is corrupted by this um entity this sort of blood goddess um mm-hmm. who's obviously one of the outer gods that's trying to get yeah, in clearly the game um, and it's clearly just puppeteering him. Like I, I, I there's no delusions of agency no. there. But like he's going to create this like kingdom of blood, mm. um, and and pull in all of these other essentially outcasts into that. And then and then you know, it's of course it's the guy you first fight who's like the perennial like I can't beat this boss. I keep fighting this boss <laughs> character. Um, but his like reaction is like I'm just going to become the most ultra loyal like like the whole golden order will be decayed and rotted and destroyed and i will still fight for it and i will still regard anybody who comes up against it as a fundamental traitor to the natural order even though i'm an outcast right even Um, though by its standards i am filth yeah i am born to be filth yeah i mean he's like he's like yeah he's the kind of uh, margaret um so yeah, it's, it's like Morgoth and Margaret, isn't it? It's, it's like it. they they take the absolute opposing um, positions, um, and and like I just love that. I love their relationship. I, I like that they you never they never engage with each other. Like there's no actual interaction between them, but they clearly have this sort of duality. Um, and it's so understated. Um, I mean, very typical again of these games to do something like that. Um, but they they work really well. Oh, it's um, beautiful, isn't it? The dynamic between them. Again, even though they don't interact within the game at all, there is no sort of cumbersome like cutscene where they're talking to one another or anything like that. But you get their relationship just by their positioning, by little things that they say to you as the player, um, and where they are, where they're situated. It is stunningly clever subtle storytelling uh, and it's the kind of storytelling that you can really only get away with in a video game it's very particular to that medium yeah no absolutely it's 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 because of the way that you can tell stories through um through the the world itself through through those kinds of small details you you can understate things to a degree that other mediums just don't allow for because yeah, yeah you just wouldn't be telling a story of course any it would just medium. be like if i mean if it were an, even another visual medium like film or television you'd just be seeing images right it wouldn't really mean anything you'd have nothing to anchor them but it here it's thing because you can revisit areas because you can take your time and look at things like like the details of armor the style of of weapons and architecture and so on and so forth there is an innate storytelling and mythos building in those elements and from soft r they are the masters of it they are just mm. the masters of it i can't think of another another video game or series of video games that does anything to the same degree mm. No, absolutely. It's 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 it's. I I mean I think they're quite unique, and I think whatever comes after the the Souls games, and I think they are definitely 
sort of hitting some of their limits. I mean, especially all of yeah. the sort of really bad copycats that oh, goodness, you know, yes. proliferate um, on Steam stores. Um, I mean, there's good copycats as yeah. well. Like, oh, know, there's, absolutely. There's really I mean, decent ones. But like, I think as a as a genre, it is perhaps becoming a tad stayed. Uh, yes. Yeah, you know, well, we, we, yeah. we've now got to that very particular point where they're doing the remakes, of course. So we've got the remake of Demon Souls, which is wonderful, by the way. It's mm. really, really wonderful and a great way of playing that game because, of course, mm. the original Demon Souls was kind of the antecedent of these games. It was the first yeah. of its kind. And so playing it on the, was it the PS3 that originally came out on or PS2? I can't quite remember. But it was one of the earlier PlayStation consoles. Doesn't really stand up anymore it's a very sort of naive version of these games so playing a remake of that is wonderful mm. it doesn't have all of the elements that make it work yet because it's still no. sort of yeah it, it emerges i mean what's amazing about so many of the imitations and i think that's probably true of them as well like they just miss what makes these yeah. things work yes quite often do. Yeah, and, and they focus like, yeah. on one element, and it's almost always technical rather than abstract. Mm. They go for the difficulty, and that's mm. it. They think that that's what makes these games. Oh, they're just hard. Well, no, that's really fundamentally missing the point. It's missing the point of the appeal of the technicalities, and, and let alone all of the other stuff that goes on. Yeah, they're not hard for the sake of being hard. That's like the the critical thing. The the, the difficulty curve exists as a part of how you're supposed to experience this world so it's, it's yes written, yeah so it's 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 a it's another aspect of telling the story it exactly exist that for its own its own sake yeah and, that's and, it's not separate it's not separate from the experience of the story like a lot of elements of the games actually I mean, one of the most impressive elements of the the soul series and bloodborne and elden ring is the way it integrates the technical elements of the game into the mythology and, and into the the gaming world it's it's amazing I mean, we were talking before about sort of or tears and, and and sort of that value of having a vision and of course I'm, i mean uh, Miyazaki is is definitely a sort of auteur of the mm. video game world um, in, in how he's constructed these games. And I think one of the things that m makes auteurs potentially quite good um, and actually makes any other approach to artistic creation, any approach that doesn't have any kind of vision behind it, fundamentally flawed, which I think a lot of the imitators are struggling with, mm -hmm. um, is the fact that... like. I, I, if you don't have that holistic vision where all of the elements exist to serve the same root thing, if the, if if each of the constituent parts of the artwork, and you know, I'll just for the sake of argument describe video games as art, despite mm -hmm. the controversy, very boring <laughs> controversy around the subject, um, then then the whole thing just falls apart, or it yeah. feels fractured and yeah. unsatisfying. Um, and and yeah, like like a really good work of art, be it a painting, a book, or or a video game, um, has that. It has that binding vision. It is a totality at the end yeah. of the day. There's a sort of um, holistic element going yeah. on, isn't there? Where this this wonderful alchemy, where everything works together in service of the the whole vision and the 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 the, the total engine. All of those components and systems working together becomes so much more than just a, a collection of moving parts. Hmm. And influence only works if it goes towards creating a new coherent and, and totalizing vision. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing wrong with picking out a work like Elden Ring or any of the Dark Souls games to get inspiration. But if that's not going to feed into a new work that has that consistency of vision, if that's just going to mm -hmm. be, you know, some kind of Frankenstein game that, that like merges different popular elements right now without any feeling of how they come together, then mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's got it's gonna be bad. And like yeah, I mean I think like what we're probably waiting for right now in the video game, well, at least as I can see, is is that is that new thing that's going to offer that sort of totalizing experience um, yeah. that isn't uh, a Souls game, that, that, that is a different type of game. Yes, uh, that changes then, the zeitgeist yeah. completely. I mean, it, we haven't had one for a very long time, something that that redefines what video games are. I mean, in, in the past, we've obviously we've had things like, like Doom, when that came out, changed the landscape completely. Things like Half-Life completely changed the landscape. Yeah. Um, Final Fantasy VII changed the landscape. Resident Evil changed the landscape. Um, 
um the the original dark souls changed a great deal um mm. but i'm sh- there there isn't there hasn't been anything recently that is compl- i mean elden ring is probably the closest example i can think of certainly in sort of mainstream video gaming that has changed the landscape so completely that it's affected the marketplace of video games yeah i mean i think what elden ring really did and lots of people said this at the time so i'm certainly in the way original in this take um (laughs) is is just prove that the problem was never with the open world format but the laziness with which it was handled exactly Um, that i mean i you know i'm i'm a fan of open world games in general and i've liked a lot of the ones that people generally don't like but that doesn't mean that i'm not very aware of their flaws i mean certainly the ones created under bethesda for example which don't get me wrong i have enjoyed for the most part but yeah i mean elden ring kind of shows them up it really does in elden ring it doesn't matter where you turn and it doesn't matter how incidental your location is there's something going on there is something tangible there's something aesthetic there's something beautiful and even when there's not a specific story happening there's a suggestion of story even if it's something silly like you'll find a tiny little beach somewhere where there's a beached octopus and maybe there's something attacking it or there's something harassing it or whatever little silly things like that there is narrative everywhere you turn and there isn't an empty quarter of the entire map no that's the key thing nothing feels there just to be there and so many open world games feel like that is the majority of the map except for this very thin pathway where the mm-hmm. main narrative takes place and that's it and then of course you have the problem the big problem with most open world games which is the main narrative almost doesn't exist mm. They're so perfunctory, they're so lacking in rhythm and intrigue and inspiration that when you finally get to the end, it's such a letdown. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. It, 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 never, it never really pays off. Um, the only one I can think because... of, the, there are two that I've played that actually are, are pretty good, and those are um, Fallout New Vegas. That's very good by Obsidian. And Obsidian's other one, actually, The Outer Worlds, that has a very good payoff at the end. Um, but beyond, but even play... they, they pale compared to what Elden Ring does. Mm. Mm. no i mean i think that is like just generally the way like it's just it's very hard to do and i think like i mean i called it lazy before which is in in a way um a little unfair because these are i think it is a very hard medium to get right Mm. um but it just is demonstrably true that it hasn't been gotten right no it's true of cases and and they they there is a lot of there are a lot of games who that are just sort of they're open world because open world was the thing not because That's they it. had an open world story to tell they didn't yes, have or, yeah yeah the potential for a world to even exist so they're just these giant arenas <laughs> where yeah. nothing is going on <laughs> yeah and that feeling of emptiness that i think some games even like utilize that well like i think <laughs> a game that utilizes that really well oh the spaceship game where you go from planet to planet um oh, oh um um, uh no man's sky no man's sky i think no man's sky actually makes some i mean no man's sky has this bizarre journey as a game from being underwhelming and disappointing the majority mm. of people to being um more well regarded today i think absolutely general, i like, mean it's like it's, it's are, basically yeah. unrecognizable from what it was it is nigh unrecognizable mm. it is a a very interesting experience no man's sky i liked mm. it when it came out for what it was i liked it mm. when it came out i think it was a very much a victim of its marketing of its yes. own marketing if it were if it were what it was originally intended to be before sony kind of got a hold of it and marketed it as what it wasn't then i think it would have been phenomenal successful if it released at a budget independent price mm. and was then i think it possibly would have been one of the most successful indie games ever as it stands it was not marketed that way it was marketed as this revolutionary mainstream game and had a mainstream price tag attached to it unfortunately um and it just didn't deliver what was advertised <laughs> no no absolutely not i mean this is a i mean this is a problem with all kinds of games when um small studios produce an ambitious but limited mm. project that you know has like very 
neatly defined limits that work for it yep. um, and then it gets taken up um, i'm thinking of um there was a sort of uh i think it was a first person game where i can't remember the title of it but it was sort of like a uh an apocalyptic in english game where everyone was taking these happy drugs in order yes, to yes um, we happy few we happy few yes and that's exactly the story of we happy few you know like it starts off as this very limited project that just gets taken away um with itself too much partly fan yeah. expectation that they, they were never able to control and then the big studios come in and everything gets a million times worse yeah um, that seems yeah. to be the case i mean i remember following that project from inception because aesthetically it looks so interesting oh, yeah i mean uh, basically it is like i remember playing it initially and, and actually being i mean that's one of the few games where uh there aren't many games where i feel like i bought into the hype and got them and then <laughs> regretted it yeah. um the most recent was Biomutant, which is an exact example of ah. one of those un uh, open world games that fail spectacularly by being generic. For me, um, it was Agony. Did you ever see Agony, um, which was supposed to be like um, a representation of a Dantean vision of hell that you're wandering mm. through? Um, and it's aesthetically gorgeous. I mean, it is mm. it is graphically and aesthetically amazing, but it's it is unplayable. <laughs> it's so yeah. badly coded it's so badly and ineptly put together that the aesthetics can't save it there's nothing you can do to save that game <laughs> you know it's well named it's well named in that regard it's agonizing <laughs> to play I feel like a game like that would have almost been better if they'd just made it a point and click adventure or something yeah. and just like leaned into narrative like absolutely yeah, yeah. if it had like um the way it would it could have worked beautifully i mean did you did you watch my let's play of layers of fear at all oh yeah yes i did yeah if yeah. it had that kind of control system to it which is very simple very it's very it is kind of a mixture of point and click and first person horror effectively that would have worked really well for it but what it's yeah. got going on is like nothing i've ever come across it's just so over complicated and nothing even even the simple stuff doesn't work mm. Mm. there's nothing wrong with overcomplicated if you can get people invested enough in the mechanics so that but it then has to come together is the other yeah. thing like like i think there's two mistakes with complexity it's it you don't really earn the complexity so no one cares enough to learn but, it yeah or, or or it just doesn't functionally work mm -hmm. like it's actually essentially broken yeah, um, yeah it hurts to play yeah. i mean and, and yeah. of course it doesn't matter how aesthetically beautiful or clever a game is or wonderful if it's control system if the feedback doesn't work people mm. are not going to enjoy it they're not going to play it i mean some games i mean some games that really brilliant clever games make a virtue of that so i'm thinking of pathologic 2 obviously mm. Mm. <laughs> which does have this slightly janky broken control system but because of the nature of the game, because it is effectively a despair simulator and it wants to hurt you, it works <laughs> in but its own peculiar I way. Because the game makes you very aware that that's what it's doing aesthetically. <laughs> Um, and it'd be a bit like like watching like a like a Eastern European like neo modern grim film and complaining mm -hmm. about like oh the pan shots were way too long I just felt <laughs> I felt really anxious watching them like like well you know yeah, that's, that's the, the point, point of right? the film yeah. like, like if a film does that then then you know that you're you know that you're kind of in safe hands with the artwork because the artwork yeah. is doing what it should do. Whereas you can tell the difference between that and like, you know, a technically bad film. Yes. If just it's just uses... a mistake or yeah, an error, like, if it's not intentional yeah. effectively, I mean, that, that's yeah. the weird thing about the pathologic that it is a painful experience to go through. It really does hurt it. But I was, I was getting anxious by the end of that. Mm. Let's play. It was actually starting to give me a little bit of anxiety. Um, but that's what it's for. Yeah. It's yeah. designed to make you feel that way. And everything about the game informs you of that from the first instance. And because that's the relationship that it draws, you're fine. It, it doesn't try to deceive you. It doesn't try to trick you as to what it's trying to do. Hmm. Or at least it doesn't do so in a way that doesn't have like an aesthetic payoff. Like, exactly. There's nothing wrong with a with something like subverting your expectations, but it still has to be for a, a reason that's intentional to the author. Yes. Um, 
and and like I, I just think like like so many I mean I, I actually just today was watching a film with a friend where I mean it's been very popular most people have liked it <laughs> I like aspects of it I think some aspects of it work really well um, a film called everything everywhere all at once um, and I think like this is a film like that, that really shows like where not knowing what you're doing or what you want to do really um <laughs> damages the movie yeah um and the film i mean like, uh, the film is just sort of it's got a lot of ambition it's got a lot of cinematography that's really clever mm-hmm. um you know it's it's got this sort of like manic cinematography so like there are there are these this constant like anxiety of like 12 problems will be presented to the characters in every single scene and they'll be expected to address all 12 problems in that scene um and and it's just constant so every scene is like that um and it's got you know this magical realist stuff which is obviously commenting on on the character situations and it's mm-hmm. it's all about this sort of uh, you know, i'd call a petty bourgeois sort of uh family um based around this laundromat um they're they're chinese immigrants so there's sort of some racial politics thrown in so they're sort of commenting on that but they're also commenting on the intergenerational stuff about uh-huh. um, the mother's relationship to her lesbian daughter and then and then the marriage between her and her husband which is what took her to america and there's a lot of like regret and bitterness over stuff and then there's the father who's coming to visit who has traditional views and didn't approve of the original marriage and they're keeping uh-huh. the lesbian uh the lesbian relationship of the grandchild secret um and they all gets wrapped up in this like multiverse plot line the problem is so many of those elements that they just described are completely incidental to the story that is being oh. told so like you could i honestly think the film would be better if you just got rid of the magical realism and made it a domestic drama about yeah. all of that all of those dynamics be- not because i'm against magical realism i love magical realism mm-hmm. but because they weren't using the magical realism to say anything about those things that's equally just, mm. even like the chinese element like you could have made them an African immigrant family, a West African immigrant family, say, for example, mm-hmm. um, and you could have told the exact same story, no elements, right. you just would draw from, I mean, there was a lot of like stereotypes, I think, when you'd <sighs> drawn from different stereotypes and it's not even a good thing in of itself. No, so it, it basically could have been sort of like I- immigrant minority X. Yeah, it yeah, could have been like, anyone. There was nothing, like they were, they, they were obviously commenting on some things, but they weren't saying anything about the things that they were commenting on. So like they do yeah. have like that dynamic that's very stereotypical of like the Asian mother saying really mean things to the Asian daughter. Uh-huh. Um, and and I, I guess that's a kind of like, you know, a trope, but, but they didn't say anything about that. You know, they, they didn't that's have so anything. That's so common, to, isn't it? Yeah. Don't, don't you find that that's really a problem in a lot of, not, I mean, it, I'm, you know, I'm getting my old man hat on at the mm. moment. It's, it's the, the get off my lawn, old man yelling at cloud hat. <laughs> um, but there is, there, I, I do perceive a problem with certainly a lot of mainstream cinema, television, even at quite a lot of, published fiction where it wants to have the patina of saying something about something it wants to have the kudos of that but doesn't actually want to take a position or make a commentary of any kind yeah i mean i guess that also comes from not having that holistic vision because if you don't yeah. have a holistic vision if you're just taking elements of things and squashing them together and i feel like this film very much was doing that i mean Mm -hmm. there's some very like self-conscious references to the matrix i mean the the way that the original setup work um so they can sort of hack into the minds of alternative universes versions of themselves to gain skills and knowledge and this works exactly like how in the matrix you could just download (laughs) you know knowledge into yourself so like except it's done in a more silly way I, Mm -hmm. i remember saying to my friend I was watching with um the like it felt like a, a two and a half hour episode of Rick and Morty <laughs> which is kind of a nightmare because you really don't want Rick and Morty to be two and a half no, hours no long. Um, absolutely not <laughs> and yeah I mean like I mean some some aspects of it were literally like a two and a half hour episode of Rick and Morty like there's an alternative universes where universe where they all have sausage dogs uh it's a hot dogs for hands could, could be exactly directly like from a, the show right it could be directly yeah. from the show <laughs> um and and they learn how to use their feet really well because obviously they can't use their fingers so they all like play <laughs> piano with their feet it's very yeah like <laughs> the problem with non-sequitur humor over and over and over again is it loses 
all meaning eventually yeah. like just everything over, is meaning. yes over a period of like more than say 20 minutes half an hour <laughs> yeah it loses it. it becomes a slush doesn't it yeah yeah and like tonal variation is i think something that actually because i was just i think we were talking earlier about like how tonal variation can be done well and badly um and sort of veering back onto elden ring is like a really good examples of tonal variation i mean like every place and character feels very different you could easily imagine like someone like say i don't know the, the space pope uh turtle pope <laughs> guy uh, very <laughs> passive of house doesn't necessarily feel like he belongs in in the same universe as as like you know the like i don't know renala a queen of the full moon right like, they, or right like, or whatever yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. and aesthetically alone he's hilarious isn't he? he's yeah. absolutely hilarious the fact of him but there's also like a tonal variation in him isn't there yeah you see yeah. him and he's funny he's incredibly funny he's a giant tortoise in a pope's hat i mean you you can't help but find that hilarious and yet when you talk to him he has incredible gravity and he is one of the very few characters who will tell you a well at least i say that he will tell you a little bit about what's going on what he actually does is tell you his interpretation of what's yeah. going on he has this kind of open spirituality though that is is strange and that it is definitely it? one version but he doesn't have like any of like the bigotry of the no. other characters like like he just outright doesn't like like you, you go to the priest with all of your um i mean this is like consciously set up as a as a as a contrast by the mm -hmm. game very clearly so you go to the police the priest at the round table i can't remember his name i've never really followed his plot line so i'm not <laughs> very familiar with the character but if you give him a scroll he'll always no matter what the scroll is even if the scroll is like called like the golden order scroll of orthodoxy or something I don't know <laughs> scroll, but like no matter how clearly like like dogmatically good the scroll is according to his religious faith he will still say oh that is a that is oh, a blasphemous it's, scroll it's, blasphemy, it's, yes. it's terrible i'll still teach you but i'm very very judgmental yes i'm it. i'm reluctant to do so but i will yeah um as and of course the other person you can bring scrolls to is is the turtle um yep. and 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 he will always say no matter what scroll you bring to him that he doesn't accept that there are like that there's this duality of heretical no. and, and non-heretical you know all things are sacred he's got that yep. kind of almost animist vision of like the world is suffused with the sacred right um, so if if it's possible to exist then it has to be sacred by definition i think that's where he's coming from isn't it yeah um so it doesn't really matter no he's completely non-judgmental in that regard yeah I mean, the only bad thing in his idea is like is like the rupture of life is like the dis is like the destruction of existence is is that kind of damaging um existence itself but he doesn't really he's not really and in that way he's not really wedded to like the other dogmatic perspectives of the game in nope. the way that almost everyone else is and that's like but it's a tonal variation but it's a tonal variation that exists within the logic of the world and that's how you mm -hmm. see tonal variation that that there has to be a coherent reason for it. Like there's a difference even philosophically, I think, between um where you have like a kind of eclecticism of just random parts and an eclecticism where there's a guiding principle for your eclecticism where the different parts that you draw together still all there's a reason why you draw those parts like you're, mm -hmm. you're thinking not just at random you're drawing parts that fit together that that actually cohere into something and that's the, i mean um, that's he, one of yeah. the most amazing elements of elden ring isn't it the fact that there's so much of it there's so much going on ideologically alone there are so many interpretations of the various different metaphysics that are happening and so many gods and demigods and outer gods and entities that would be gods striving to establish their own version of what that metaphysics is and yet somehow all of these moving parts all of these elements do come together mm. it all works it all makes yeah. sense when everything does eventually come it's it's very like dark souls in that regard i mean it it requires you to invest in the assumptions of the universe very very much yeah. so like it like in dark souls you have this whole thing this this dichotomy between fire and abyssal shadow only those terms don't mean what they mean 
in waking life so fire isn't just a a physical phenomena in that universe it's em- it's emblematic it's emblematic of of life and of vitality and of of civilization and of ingenuity You've got a similar thing happening in Elden Ring. I mean, the the Elden Ring itself is mm. just the most fascinating principle, isn't it? The notion that it's a symbol, but it's also an engine. It's the engine of reality, and it is reality itself at the there's same also, time. There's also the sense constantly that it is a kind of intrusion on the world, that it is actually yes. an alien thing that's actually yes. invaded this older world um and and that has its own machinations that are really just indifferent to all of Mm -hmm. the agents that it it plays around with i mean that's what rani the witch really realizes that's what she gets isn't it that's what she sees and that's why i mean that's why she she embarks on her her whole endeavor isn't it to Mm. to establish herself ultimately as one of these outer gods i mean that's kind of what she becomes at the end isn't it a kind of almost an anti outer god though in a way because she which, which she's trying to do, i mean she, she kind of says it, i think she even uses like a period of like isolation like mm-hmm. like like this kind of like sense of everybody will be almost alienated in this in this universe she's creating but it's not like the end that she's after she's almost trying to she's seeing all of these people that are hopelessly enchanted by these outer gods um, all of these, all these kind of souls that are, are are basically the puppets of these greater beings, and she wants to give them this kind of space to mature yeah. outside of their influence. And it, and it's framed as quite a horrific thing, like this period of like thousands of years of loneliness and nothing mm-hmm. um, that that she needs to sort of inflict on every every conscious entity in the entire yeah, it's... game. It's almost um, as though to to get them to realize their own identities and agency, they have to be removed from the metaphysical engines to which they were yeah. born. And that the the period of transition, which is it's suggested to be millennia, isn't it? That the yeah. people entities are going to have to function in this state of isolation is a necessary evil. Mm. Yeah. Like it's 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 a part of their their I guess a kind of adolescence if you sort of think I suppose so sort of childhood yeah and given uh, the general corruption of the world that you occur in and the, the the filth of it just that you know not just the physical filth but the metaphysical filth of it the fact that she's right everything is breaking down everything is corrupt and diseased it's like well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's a she it's, has it's a, a, it's a solution. I mean, she is one of the only characters. The the other that has come up with a kind of viable metaphysical solution to this, as horrific as it is. The other one is the is the flame, of course, the flame of frenzy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's the only. I mean, I guess like every other version, even even the dung eaters version, are essentially actually variations on a theme. Like the yeah. world just keeps ticking. It just ticks on a different in a different way. And like I yeah. Think the nice I, of, those endings is probably fears because at least in fears version the sort of outcast get a place in that universe yeah. they get like they get they get something you know even yes. if it's still within this sort of like endlessly ticking um thing like like it's a it's a more it's a more universal vision mm-hmm. but it's still ultimately the same kind of vision it's yeah. it's not an ending is it it's not a, like a transformation ultimately um it's it is still going to be the same cycles so the the same things will be happening i mean it, even the dung eater's vision is kind of interesting there is a, a line of dialogue that he has where he's, he basically just spells it out to you he tells you what he wants to do and he says that something along the lines of let it all be rotten filth until rotten filth are deemed as holy and sacred so again it's a bit it's a bit like rani's ending in a way it's a bit like rani's ending where yeah he's going to inflict millennia of what would be considered to be horror like the ultimate horror upon creation where every waking moment is filth and disease and suffering but eventually it will lead to a condition where the conception of filth and disease and suffering as evil or as unwanted is anathema yeah yeah he 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 wants to change the terms on a certain level and i think that's where 
the the sort of I mean it's it's sort of Shabriri who who orchestrates it for the Free Fingers and mm -hmm. um, does so in a very malevolent way. Of course, he just yeah. outright tricks you at yeah. every single um, at every single point in, mm -hmm. in a quite sociopathic manner. I mean, I think the interesting thing about the Free Fingers is obviously its relationship to the Two Fingers because obviously, yeah, right. Three Fingers, Two Fingers, it's a hand. Like so, basically, like that's just outright saying that the three fingers and the two figures are one entity like or not... maybe shards of one yeah. entity the suggestion i get is that at some at some point this whatever this outer elder entity is it's it's different aspects of it somehow or different shards of it somehow that have become conflicting you get that sort of like the free obviously like free is like an unbalanced number it, it represents chaos and, mm -hmm. and entropy and the two sort of the you know the perfect binary number yeah. is this sort of god of order and 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 eternity and 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 sterility as well like mm -hmm. like nothing ever changing and that's kind of reflective of like the most pedestrian ending of the game where you just create a sort of renewed golden order that is yes you just repair yeah. the Elden Ring effectively it's the straightforward quest yeah. isn't it you know the straightforward I fantasy quest. And it kind of gives you like it's like it's like the happy ending, except everything is really off because you yeah. just know that nothing has been changed. Like nothing yeah. is going to go differently. And like you are that's just that's it, right? You've yeah. had the experience of this world, so you know that it's just yeah. going to cycle round again. It's all yeah. just going to come round to the same stuff again. Yeah. Maybe subtle differences along the way, but the dynamics will be the same. And there's a real melancholia to that. Mm. But my suspicion with the Three Fingers is that because it's kind of still essentially a part of that metaphysics, and it just does this awesome destruction of this of of everything. Mm -hmm. Like, does that because it's it's sort of implied but never outright stated. Like, or, or those who state it aren't really speaking for the Three Fingers. They're the people who are against the Three Fingers. Yeah. They they always frame it as the destruction of everything forever, just like an eternity of nothing. But the Three Fingers doesn't. And no. it could just be another renewal. It could just right. take us back to the two fingers again. It could. Like the, it could. Yeah. But that's certainly not what happens, is it? I mean, like the um it is not just destruction for destruction's sake. It's a new condition. Yeah. That's like created in the in fire. the cleansing flames, right? Mm. And it's yeah, I mean it's just it's a very um I mean, and in a way, like the Free Fingers always kind of lies because it lies <laughs> even to its subject. Like Hayato is definitely um, after that nothing. Like is mm -hmm. after like the this. I mean, like and quite justifiably, like Hayato is <laughs> not done very well in this world. This world is not treated her particularly great. <laughs> um, I think there's that one point where you just outright convince her to eat Shabriri grapes, which is mm -hmm. just eyeballs, without yeah. her realising that. And if you tell her, apparently she starts vomiting. So oh yeah, she goes mad. Yeah, yeah she, she loses yeah. her mind if you, if you tell her what they are. Yeah, which is understandable but not yeah. particularly pleasant no, i mean she has like an absolutely uh, atrocious time not to mention that she also is that girl you meet outside of the castle who asked for you yeah. to go and save her father and like she's clearly there's like some bizarre thing going on between, yes like, there's yeah. like a it's part of the broken metaphysics of this universe, isn't it? You you see like renewals and echoes and cycles occurring everywhere. Mm, everywhere yeah. you go. And often they are illogical. They don't make sense. And yet they do, given the status of this world. It's such mm. a brilliant thing they've done here. I mean, it, it, it is dynamically. When you drop into the world, it's the same dynamic that you have in the Dark Souls game. So you are dropping into a world where everything is already broken. Yes. The history has already passed. The great battles, the wars, the whatever metaphysical encounters or prophecies of they've all passed already and everything's breaking down everything's going wrong and that is such an incredible dynamic to operate in isn't it in a fantasy universe in any mm. kind of mythology and here what it gives them license to do is ultimately play with the nature of reality yeah yeah they're, they're they're experimenting with what can be made of reality itself and like the game kind of interestingly rewards ambition in that like the more ambitious the characters are the better their endings usually it does seem to be um, that case doesn't it like the ones who are really who it seems to be the ones who are not 
subscribing to a to a particular path. So the ones who have not bowed down and said, "No, I'm just going to do as say the Golden Order wants me to do," or "I'm not going, to, I'm going to bow down and do whatever my prescribed destiny is," yeah. those are the ones that seem to do the best out of it. Yeah, the the ones who are just sort of, um, I mean, basically asking for freedom from from this metaphysics. Like, yeah. Like, I mean, I think you know, Rihanna is a really good example of that, uh, but she's by no means the only example. There no. is obviously like a, a really like pointed um, contrast, uh, which is um, Nicola, who is like arguably the most ambitious, but also. Mm -hmm doesn't succeed no <laughs> rather cat i mean the halo tree is is what it quite, is for that exact reason yeah quite catastrophically um, fails yeah. actually <laughs> yes yeah, so it ends a... up in like morgue's prisoner uh which is yeah. very tragic because i don't think morgue conceives of him as a prisoner <laughs> no it's um, really bizarre isn't it like the dynamic between those two is really strange <laughs> yeah like 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 i mean yeah he just sees I mean, I think he's actually. I think Morg is attracted to Mikola's utopian vision because mm -hmm. Mikola's utopian vision is very much a land it's, for outcasts, but it's just right. a land of outcasts that isn't horrific. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't horrifying in every way, and also like and like with Morg isn't um, isn't fundamentally determined by some other outer god that's just mm -hmm. playing its own games. Um, but the Halo Tree is like. It's one of the most beautiful places, but also equally one of the most tragic places yes. in the game because, like, everything speaks of like what what Mikola was trying to do, and you just get this fantastic, almost like failed Arthurian vibe yeah. from from the Halo Tree. Like, like he was trying to create paradise and very, very nearly did. Almost um, got there, and yet it's it's corrupt, isn't it? It's it, it's yeah. almost like nothing you can do in this world. It doesn't matter how mm. profound your ideas are if it's within if it's like an echo or within the purview or constraints of the prescribed metaphysics it's going to fail mm. I mean, it doesn't I matter it's so sad fundamentally misunderstood just how much the elden ring the the elden beast or whatever the creature that had come to the world with the elden ring um had corrupted the the original tree like yeah like, like whatever that original tree was, I mean, it was almost certainly at that time controlled by the dragons. I gather who mm -hmm. was, I guess, the first Elden Lord is that dragon, and and yeah, like it's it's, but he still thinks something can be made through yes. another tree, albeit, but he's still using the same, he's still using the same sort of, um, I guess, seeds, like literally. Yeah, seeds. it's the, it literally, so um, it's the same symbolism, it's the same mechanisms, isn't it? And as a result of that, it's the engine itself that's corrupt. So if you're using yeah. it, it doesn't matter what your intentions are, it's going to create corruption. Yeah, yeah. And he, he just, he, yeah. I mean, he he correctly sort of like critiques the Golden um, Order, but just repeats it essentially yeah, essentially yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah and as a result it fails i mean i it's like when you get to the volcano manor and you talk to tanith and the characters around mm. there and they're, they're framed as though it's a very dark and negative place and yet their incredible rebellion against the golden order and against the tree and the metaphysics of this world is kind of right isn't it mm. I and mean, what's interesting about them is that they don't really fail because don't. you don't actually kill him. Like he's just an endless no. beast of rebirth, so he's never going to die. Like, no, Rikard like is. Um, Rikard yeah. seems to have aspired to the status of a god, doesn't he? At that point, yeah. and although he doesn't quite become what he wants to become, which is essentially one of the big boys, one of the really big gods that can influence everything. <laughs> He's still around. I mean, there's that horrible sequence after you've killed him. If you go back to his arena and you find Tanith eating parts of him. Yeah, yeah, so that he can be rebirthed in her. And yeah. I mean, that kind of feels like superfluous to requirements anyway, because I just don't think he's in any way gone. But like, yeah, no. I'm sure he would. I'm sure he'd accept that. <laughs> yeah. I don't think he'd have any problem with me being rebirthed in Tanith. I mean, Tanith is a tragic character. Oh, I love Tanith. And I loved her daughter. Oh, she was fabulous. I Just yeah. one of my favourite characters in the whole thing. Although I liked her better as a lizard. 
Yes, Raya is. Yeah, Raya the the scout. She's 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 lovely. I mean, she's one of Isn't the she? few genuine characters in in the game. And yeah, yeah and of course, uh, you have to be. You you have an awful choice to make with regards to her, don't you? An awful, yeah. awful choice. And both choices are bad. Yeah, you can either keep her in perpetual ignorance or 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 essentially leave her in perpetual misery. I guess yeah. the third option just outright euthanize her as she asks yeah. for, which is like that that none of the options are good when it comes none to None of right. the yeah. options are good. I um, mean, like when I did it, I was in a real quandary. I really was. I mean, I understand where Tanith is coming from. I mean, I, I hated yeah. it. I absolutely hated it. But I did give her the potion to, to mm. make her forget in the end. It of does mine. feel like the least awful option. Like like just out like not it doesn't feel like a good option just no. the least awful yeah it's the least horrible isn't it yeah. it's uh, it's the only one i think that doesn't require you to really compromise yourself in the worst possible way <laughs> mm. i mean this the, the whole game like one of the more understated um i want to come back to tariff actually because i want to talk about patches at some point because oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he is he is in he's interesting in this game in ways that he's always interesting but he's not interesting in quite the same way in the same no. as he is in others but um but to continue with Raya, like I, I there's a really interesting sort of sub theme of the game um that kind of links to hyeta as well um and and Nephili, who we talked about earlier um of of the sort of sins of the parents being yes. inflicted on the children and like raya is like a, a you know like the most i get i'm almost the most ham-fisted version of that because it's very literalized with yeah, her, yeah like it's literally her pedigree uh -huh. um but i mean of course the whole idea of odin's uh, is that i mean like mm -hmm. like the this idea of um because it's kind of just implied that odin's are a uh, kind of a well it could be that the god that more worships is doing it that, that, that she's creating them possibly or it could be some other entity it's very unclear it but, is but... isn't it i mean there's almost a suggestion that it's 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 just what they are it's how it's yeah. part it's almost like they are essential to the metaphysics for some reason there has to be this underclass of entity but there's also the suggestion that they weren't always inherently an underclass like in the age when the um when you know the uh, the sort of proto humans were were sort of like um, the demi humans were more sort of accepted, mm -hmm. and there was you know I mean you get this um, weirdly from Kenneth Height, uh, whose story is sadly very incomplete, but yeah. like his whole relationship with with the um, uh, with the demi humans and and the idea that they were a part of like society at one yeah. point and, and you, I think, you like, get little the... subtle suggestions of that all the way through don't you like there, there is the um the castle where they're described as servants but obviously they were slaves because they rose up and rebelled and murdered everyone <laughs> yes yeah yeah like it is yeah there's like, there's just a lot of that but yeah, the whole thing of the children like like just gets repeated and repeated and repeated. again and um, again and again yeah, and again yeah. usually the something that a parent does that leads to the disgrace or even the the destruction of their children mm, yeah yeah um, and, and interestingly kind of... you see that you see that escaped by by rani right because she's Renala's yeah. child and she completely defies the prescriptions of her mother i mean i think in a way like Renala is already orchestrating that um like Renala just sort of i mean Renala obviously is sort of caught in the tragedy of mm -hmm. um her romance but she of course. just operates outside of i mean that whole the whole carrion family i guess in a sense operate outside of the prescriptions of that world because what they originally are of course is just a, like an outsider tribe from mm -hmm. the sort of old world that had its own metaphysics you know the the moon worship is just different of course in order um and and i it's all dressed up quite nicely i mean even to a degree the 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 sort of turtle pope does does this kind of dressing it up <laughs> like like making like a mythology of it but it's clearly like they couldn't like they just dealt with any outside order by smashing mm -hmm. it until yeah. they came across the order of the moon and they're just like well we can't smash it but they can't smash us so yeah. i guess in this one case we'll just find an accommodation it's a bit yes, like we'll in what happened 40,000 between like the um between the order mechanicus and and the imperium of man yes. like like so not, we, 
<laughs> we can't yeah. abide any deviation from the human form except here because yeah. we we can't do anything about that so we'll accommodate that it's fine yeah. <laughs> like it's just it's just outright cynicism like like right. the order it's of total the hypocrisy moon. right total hypocrisy yeah. The Academy is just tolerated because they can't not tolerate. Exactly. There's nothing they can do about them, right? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, yeah. and of course, there are certain story arcs that suggest that that magic, that influence is actually very corrupting. I mean, if you mm. follow Selwyn's story arc to the end, for example, when she ultimately ends up becoming corrupted by the magic and becomes one of those big balls of faces that are made out of stone and glintstone magic. Mm. I'm always unsure. Like, does does Salen? I mean, like that's a, this is a classic like Edward moment. Um, yeah. The, the sort of yeah, and it's it's one of the most horrific in the game because Salen is really likable. In she her is, own, isn't like, she? Horrible she's... way. Like she's like pompous and nasty, but she's also like she's but... also kind of very much her own person in a world yeah. that doesn't have many people who like express their own individuality. And she's got this kind of. I wouldn't quite call it utopian, but she's got like a, a, a hopeful vision for the Academy. That yes, goes beyond so I mean, she, she has yeah. ideas at least, doesn't she? She, she sees yeah. a potential tomorrow and then yeah. it all goes horribly wrong for her. Yeah. But I'm, I'm always unsure whether she transforms into that because of her magics. And there's some indications that that might be the case or if Renala is just ah. like... Because Renala is basically... Um, uh, a, a, a sort of demigod of transformation like mm -hmm. rebirth is her thing yeah of um, course. and she's like she's like oh, i've gotten rid of renala and you know when she says that i don't know if you you saw this uh, i can't remember in the let's player because i did think i managed to watch that one but um but if you look around the room after sullen says oh i've gotten rid of her she's actually just there she's just in the she's corner. just in the corner isn't yeah, she? she's she just like shoved shoved aside. Into the corner yeah so, so she's and she's just really and she's in the corner she's completely unbothered she just says the same thing she says yeah. and then like in the next instance she's back in the middle and and sullen is like now a stone head like i just i just yeah. outright wonder if like Ronaldo <laughs> was like like ha huh, yeah, yeah you're gonna get rid of me sorry <laughs> it's not human. going to happen <laughs> <laughs> yeah like like it just yeah it's just kind of um yeah but it is like it's a truly pathetic state like she's read she can barely talk but she's yeah, still she like shakes and shudders like she's yeah. in pain it's really horrible it's a yeah, really it's, horrible thing yeah i mean it, like it, like also to give her like such a tragic end after you literally have to because you have to fight um Witch Hunter Jaren in order That's to... That's right. And like, at the end of it, like, Witch Hunter Jaren killing her would be like a, a, a less horrific thing. Probably, if you just let him get on with it, it would have been <laughs> like, better, yes. Yeah, like, like, like I, I mean, he's a complicated character because, of course, his reasons for doing so are not entirely unreasonable anyway. Right, like, right. Like, right. Yeah. So, like, he's not, like, he's not simply an asshole or know, a fanatic yeah. or a zealot no he actually yeah. has like reason behind what he's doing yeah i mean of course you meet him in that like fantastic um instance with um with the uh with the the war carnival um to to fight um oh um, oh that's amazing yeah, isn't it radagon yeah, yeah. radagon yeah oh that's so yeah. cool and that whole fight and the small horse and every, I mean, it's just so like, it's so brilliant. Like everything about that fight that is, fight is amazing. The arena yeah. in which it happens. And of course the, the after effects where the stars start to move and it, mm. the, the comets fall and change the landscape. It's like, what? Yeah. Yeah. What? Like the sense of scale to it. Um, and when you find badness. that crater, like, Finding oh, that crater is just like that I is an experience. Yeah. I honestly couldn't believe it. I mean, that Limgrave is massive anyway, and has got mm. so much to do. And then this crater alters the landscape completely and opens up an entire subterranean civilization, an area of the game. It's like how much more, how big yeah. can this game be? Yeah, I mean, it is just like it is just enormous. Like, I I wonder like just how long it would take to walk through every single area in a play. For, like, it must take it must take a few hours at the very least. At the very it, like, least, I mean, like, it's huge, yeah. isn't it? If you did yeah, all I mean, of the just, subterranean like, areas, yeah, like just the... walking through with like no no like fighting, no like like nothing stops you. Mm -hmm. You just get to sort of yeah. I I mean, I, even then, I think it would just be like a couple of hours minimum. Like it's, it's minimum. Huge. 
Yeah, and like that's I, I like I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe yeah. it when I found like the 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 sea off for a well, and yeah, you go yeah, down yeah. and it's, and there's a whole map. There's a whole yeah. subterranean map that's enormous. I mean, and that just, area just is stunning. And again, like that's another thing with like that variation in tone. Like that area just feels both completely fitting in this world but also completely very different, totally right? different yeah yeah it's beautiful it's just, beautiful yeah. i i was stunned by that area and of course the 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 boss that you fight there the ancestor mm. spirit that that remains one of my favorites in the entire game i died the first time to that because i couldn't take my eyes off it oh it is it is just stunning yeah i mean it that's that particular enemy belongs alongside like the walking mausoleums <laughs> that belongs in like a studio ghibli film like, yeah, just outright, you, like, yeah like it has that exact same ethos not thing something i would say often of a of a um of a from soft of, game. Of a from oh. soft game yeah despite the <laughs> both 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 of the primary creators being called miyazaki yeah i know um, right? it's bizarre yeah. <laughs> but um, yes. no, I mean, like, <laughs> but, the an- the ancestor spirit completely floored me the way it dances on the air and the the burning flames on its antlers are just off. Oh, mm. It was stunningly beautiful. I mean, it's cause in those areas down there that you discover the um, the sort of lo- most Lovecraftian of all the enemies, the um, that sort of star scorpion beast. I can't remember its name. Oh uh, my goodness! Head, yes, yeah, um, yeah. Astel, Astel, Astel. Yeah. Yes, yeah. With the with the the universe like poking through the cracked skull. Um, wow. just, yeah, I mean that wow. that enemy like like is so I mean enchanting that you almost yeah. don't mind losing to it. It's like no. yeah, I I got um I loved getting the um the flail from Astel, and I mm-hmm. eventually ended up with a character who had um through through multiple playthroughs. I mean I don't need multiple playthroughs because you can um, double up the um, yeah yeah, but I did through multiple playthroughs. Um, two of those flails one in each hand that was just such a fun way of playing the game like throwing <laughs> stars around and like i was technically a magic caster but i was at such a high level it didn't even yeah. matter how i played the game at that point um i just like oh. r- like running into like low low level areas and, and just <laughs> demolishing everybody in like like in like especially when you've like struggled in those areas before yes. there's something very satisfying very about going satisfying in and just like indeed uh, you're going to enjoy this now because I'm I've come back as a god and I'm yeah. going to I'm going to butcher you all just like uh... you notice a little bit more as well I mean because like every, yeah. almost every encounter you have from the lowest to the highest they there's always like subtle implied narrative happening and mm. you you get to watch it when you're a bit more powerful because you don't have to worry about dying as much yes yeah you actually get to yeah it's a very different experience and I think like the game does that very intentionally it gives mm-hmm. you this because it gives you reasons for going back at a more powerful yeah. level like it's not like because there's so much in every area you're never going to complete it in a in a first run through anyway not a so, chance not a yeah. chance i mean it was very frequent even at like even in my second playthrough that i was still occasionally finding whole dungeons i hadn't yep. gone to before i mean it got rare eventually but it, it it still happened every now and again i was always very pleased when it did um they they always do enough of a of a very even in like the more copy paste areas like uh, crypts. Mm-hmm. There's always some kind of theme to them, like yes, like transporter um, uh, chests, or there'll be you know teleporter chests. Some of them um, are mirrored, so yeah. you're like, I mean, those ones always surprise me. Where mm. you'll end up walking through areas that feel familiar you think you've already been through them, and actually you haven't. They're just oh, they're- the whole dungeon is mirrored. The, yeah, that one that repeats and repeats and repeats under the capital city, where yeah. like every yeah, and it, it it and you if you go back, the way to trick it is you have to go back, and then you end up in a, in back in the area, and then you can go forward again. Yeah, so you've got to do this like weird like like hopscotch thing to, to get to brilliant. anywhere new, because eventually you get to a point where you will just go round and round in circles, and it will never end. Yeah. Uh, you and you almost you, you, when that first happens, there's this kind of claustrophobic panic. Like, yes, <laughs> you like, get what's going place, on? Like, right? It's really like, scary. Yeah, yeah, and it's it, that one does because it because it, it when you first get to that place, obviously you're like, oh, this is one of those dungeons. I've mm-hmm. done this before. I know, I know the yeah, game. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like it might have some chests or something. Aha, I'm, I'm one slot, and then it just completely 
upends you. And yeah, there's so many examples of that where you think you know what's going on and then the game is like... It, nope. it inverts itself. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. Yeah. I mean, there's almost like a, a slightly old school feeling about it. You know, the, you, you find a lot of that kind of dungeon in older RPGs. Um and I really love that. The fact that the game is willing to do that to you, where you really you really have to think about it. It is actually a genuine puzzle. And when you do solve it, you feel like you've accomplished something. The way the game uses all of its elements makes it feel... I think the old school reference is really good because I think it makes it feel like those games that had fewer resources and it's almost like Miyazaki's like yeah I've got like this apps I mean I've got fantastic resources for this game like like, Mm -hmm. just almost unlimited really as far as like a normal game is concerned but to still take that philosophy of making everything work as hard as it possibly can nothing nothing in the game can just be everything has to be for something it's very economic in that way um which is just something imposed on you if you're very working with like the the sort of like resources of an early um period of course um, computer game studio who's you know still like working out even what a computer game is exactly (laughs) if you don't do that you're going to create a terrible experience where like the the minimal elements that you have just don't come together into anything Mm -hmm. even vaguely interesting um and of course it's the games that we remember you know that 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 did that um but to do that where you don't have to do that i think that's the real trick of this game that it it still brings that philosophy of making everything work for its money making everything absolutely absolutely, yeah i Um, mean i i remember when i reached lanedale for the first time and there's that wonderful sequence where you're, you're sort of on the outer the outskirts of lanedale and you see the expanse of it the interior of the city with all those golden roofs and districts and streets and whatnot and i just assumed it was it was a false backdrop you know it's not ex- actually there it's it just gives you the illusion of the expanse of the city and then you drop down and you're on the rooftops and you realize that every street is real yeah every rooftop is real every building is real you can explore this entire city yeah and everywhere in the game is like that. i mean the hayrick tree i mean i think by that point you've you've been for it enough to know that it will all be explorable Mm -hmm. but like even that looks more like something that would just be a backdrop in many other games like and and so many places did the intricacy and the scale it's not that the game never copy paste like i even used the term earlier to describe some of the dungeons Mm -hmm. you know that use like the same architecture you do see like repeated ruins and stuff but even in their placement there's a deliberateness and there's just so much of stuff lightly and like the like the calig tree Mm -hmm. you know I, i i think you have to play it like hundreds of hours before the game starts to wear even remotely thin in terms of what is available to you oh absolutely great because like a lot of players will never play it more than like a few hundred hours like Mm -hmm. a a normal playthrough um and you will have this sense of this complete world this sort of this sense of a world even beyond what you were able to explore which i think has its own value absolutely Um, yeah i mean it's one of the wonderful things about this game the sense of expanse i mean that's something that certainly they've tried to invest in previous FromSoft games but again because of the technical limitations of those games it's actually rather difficult to do a lot of the time Uh, but this one it the world is so expansive that it feels like there are things happening around you when you're not there yeah and actually there are because they're like timed mm-hmm. events there are like and, right. and there's orders of, of events so if you do events in particular orders that that changes what you will and won't be exposed to of so course. the world really does and also i just think that that's so much imparted through the um sense of the other characters having their own agendas in fact your agenda is consistently one of the most simplistic because you mm-hmm. are basically um this this sort of weird um you're one of these kind of weird aberrations yes you're not supposed to be technically you're a Mm. product of things going wrong yeah and i mean that's that's very typical of a fromsoft game of course you are i mean often like this game doesn't quite do it to the same scale, but like you are often like the worst of the worst, the dregs oh, of your filth. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. I, I think the one where you are the the really you are the 
absolute filth is dark souls 3 yeah where you are the ashes you're not even you're not even like a chosen undead as you are in dark souls 1 and 2 where you've been resurrected to perpetuate the cycles or whatever in dark souls 3 you're the ashes of a former hero who failed to link the fire (laughs) you're not even really a backup plan in that you're like you're not a contingency you're like we've run out of contingencies but we yeah. have this crap so yeah. let's just see if anything happens because you we are, may as well <laughs> that's it you are the muck at the end of creation yeah the yeah. last ditch effort of creation to try and suspend itself yeah. against the the onslaught of entropy mm. Mm. and that's like it, it's such a, a a wonderful twist on the sort of chosen one narrative like you are yeah. In every instance of these games, you are the absolute opposite of a chosen one. But oh, the yeah. brilliant thing is, like, if you lean into the chosen one narrative, this game will punish you. It will give you a pedestrian, mm-hmm. nothing ending that feels really unsatisfying. Yep. If you lean into the, uh, I am the dregs and I need to sort of find something else to lean on, you know, be it sort of um, uh, Rihanna or... or, um, or um, I'm sorry, going blank. Um, I'm trying to think of the uh, uh, fear. Um, you know mm-hmm. those kind of characters. You know the characters that offer. You know, even even the dung eater. Yeah, I was going to say um, even the dung eater. Technically. Yeah, I can't. I can never hear the name without flashing back to the intro um, <laughs> sequence. You know the the, the low of some. The way it's said is just yeah. brilliant. Um, <laughs> I, and many memes have already been created. Of course. They're all fantastic. Um, <laughs> um, but yes, the the low of some dung eater. Um, feel like he deserves this full like sort of title oh yeah so i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. despite <laughs> what you might think of the character just by his name he's actually a very significant and epic individual isn't he yes yeah he absolutely is like i mean all, all of all of those um uh what are they what are you called oh, in the game i can't remember what um, are they called i can't remember off the top of my head but they're they're the gods are they're, they're effectively like gods aren't they they or they're, they're almost like gods in waiting yeah, I mean, like, like, Demi- yeah, yeah, almost. Um, mm. What are they called? I can't remember off the top of my head. But yeah, they're, they're all kind of yeah. They, 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 yeah, they have similar. But you have to basically choose one of them, or yeah. you end pathetically. Because if you actually lead into the "I am the chosen one" narrative, mm-hmm. then you just kind of you just become another vessel for. Well, you, you are yeah, you're a functionary, aren't you? You yeah, ultimately yeah. just become you're just the lubricant that keeps yeah. the engine turning, and that's it. That's all you ever were. That's if that's yeah. all your ambition is, then look. I'm singing- in the throne doesn't really even seem to give you any power you just you're just no. basically just holding the scene yeah it's very it is very like when you you sacrifice yourself in dark souls you know to keep the flame burning mm. you die i mean <laughs> you do yeah yeah burning you become the kindling for the flame whereas if you ch- often if you choose the abyssal ending or one of the alternative endings where you end the metaphysics well suddenly you're a you're something of a bit more quantity something of a bit more intrigue hmm I mean, Rani the Rich kind of turns you into a consort, and it's kind of unsure what that means, but like clearly right. it's like an elevation to some degree. Like, it's not. Yeah, it's very strange, yeah. isn't it? I mean, it is clearly congruent to a marriage of some description, but it's not. It's not what we would understand as a marriage, you know. It's it's part it's part of the symbolism of her becoming, isn't it? Yeah, it seems more figurative than than then yeah it's it's it, i guess in the sense that it is archetypal like like she yeah. is like literally <laughs> framing it in those terms um and yeah like like it also feels like incidental like like she doesn't really need you no no um, not at all like, like not you're, at all. you're kind of in fact you kind of have to just basically stalk her for half the game in yeah. order to get anything like yeah like like at the end you've given her everything she needs and then and then like you just find her again in 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 her castle where she's just sort of waiting to become and she's like oh you've done enough you can you yeah. can be this like you can like it's yes. kind of like a it's, <laughs> it's like a pat on the back really more than anything yeah she, she sort of tells you well done doesn't she and that's yeah pretty much it you know yeah. you've accomplished what you're supposed to accomplish so off you go do do whatever it is you like yeah but it's an epic quest that is i remember oh, fighting yeah, yeah. the uh the dragon outside mm. of the temple that's protecting her oh that's one of the hardest oh. dragons like Oof. yeah that's yeah that's I, I, I chinsed 
that one I, I found a there's a so you can you can sort of hide in the castle itself and just keep casting and sort of running away and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it works it's 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 one of my many strategies oh quite this game. frankly I, yeah. I will judge no one for chintzing this game like, like yeah. any of the FromSoft games if the game gives you an advantage take it yes even uh, if it's naughty even if it's maybe not what the game was designed to do take it yeah but that was generally my philosophy like i'm fine when the game takes those things away like i'm not going to complain about patches (laughs) but i'm definitely going to use them when i can find them the worst um chintz i probably used is um oh um what is his name? Like the commander, something commander. Uh, oh, Neil, Commander Neil. Neil. Oh, Neil. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The first fight with him. Oh, um, in the Ionian swamps. Yeah, which is kind of a horrible fight, especially mm-hmm. that first time when you don't really know how to go up against him. Um, but you can go up into those trees up here around him. You can sort of jump up there. You can oh. just shoot him. You can just oh. shoot him. Oh, I did um, not know that. With, especially with poison um <laughs> you can just shoot him with poison and then keep hiding and watch his health slowly drain away as he screams and, and shouts yeah, and summons tells things you off, yeah um, i i he massacred me when i first because yeah. i didn't even know he was there i was just wandering around the swamps and i just happened to blunder into his clearing and that was it you know in himself he's not that hard but the southern no. creatures like they're just uh, they're oh, they're relentless they just, they're yeah. relentless they they don't give you a moment's peace to do like if you're a caster for example you're going to want to find the the quickest spells to cast because they're not going to stop harassing you and even with like if you've got um some spirit summons i mean for starters they'll kill most spirit summons really quickly (laughs) yes Um, especially at the level you're likely to first encounter him uh, Mm -hmm. where you weren't going to have like really overpowered spirit summons like Um, the mimic tier for example yes yes the mimic tier is it's easy mode isn't it it is almost broken the mimic tier it's It's brilliant i love it it is it's it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun there's a lot of spirits i love though like they're they're just they're, they're such great and it's always exciting to find like a new enemy oh, that you could summon yeah. onto your side. Oh and, my goodness, yeah, they are so much. Yeah. I mean, I, just the, the the raw fun of being able to fight alongside monsters or whatever. I just I love that to bits. I love it to absolute bits. I also like that you can upgrade any of them to such a high level that even like the early ones, like even the wolf set, can become mm-hmm. like competitive in later game. Like, yeah, like you don't lose any of them they or they you know if you want if you decide that the wolves are your thing you can just keep the wolves for yeah the whole game and just keep using them keep upgrading um, them and they will become yeah. really powerful you know and they won't be like the most powerful ones you will be taking a hit for like not, not mm-hmm. using some of the later ones but but they will be competitive still which yeah. is what matters at least against some enemies like there's there's always sort of trade-offs oh um, yes oh, there's yeah. some enemies that like summoned summoned ashes are useless against like completely oh, yeah, useless yeah. Like intentionally, sometimes. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, like sometimes it's like a very particular game mechanic that makes them useless. Like I am um, with um, oh um, the serpent guy. Uh, oh, Rikard. Uh, Rikard. The 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 lava he's got around him will obviously they'll they'll <laughs> rush into it and just yeah. stay into it until they yeah. die because they don't have the kind of AI that would be necessary <laughs> to protect them from that particular problem. There's a so, like, um. There's a dragon in the the frozen area, the Altus Plat, not the Altus. Oh plat- yeah, I know the, the one. The one um, on the frozen lake that comes out yeah. of the mist summons even the mimic tier is almost useless against him because yeah. of the, the the expansiveness of the terrain. It can't get close enough. Mm. The, the tier kind of. It, it, it appears and then it teleports out of existence when you're too far away. Mm. So you, it just cannot get close enough, and you're not going to get close to the dragon, obviously, because it's just going to blast you and kill you. Mm. No, absolutely, yeah. It, it's, it's. I mean, fortunately, I don't think that dragon is one of the hardest fights in and of itself. But oh, yeah, no, it, there is right. like that. There is that. Like, yeah, there's a few fights like that where 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 sort of summons are just not useful, <laughs> not advisable, <laughs> um, not advisable. Yeah, yeah. Um, going back to patches though um, oh, we did patches. where did you Rikard. find him first where did you find patches first because you can encounter him all over the game yeah i mean i i found him in um so there's that area where um the where you're so it, 
it's right at the beginning of the game where right? you, you, you go off into that lake where there's uh, a dragon. Yes. They want to, and then you go off to that like side lake and there's eventually a series of caves mm-hmm. and, and in one of those caves um, there is Patches. Yes, uh, you fight as a boss thing. and then he surrenders like the yes. bloody coward that he is. But I, one of the things I like about Patches is that in this game, and it's almost like a reflection of the scale of this universe and the sort of um, lack of scale of Patches. <laughs> <laughs> He's very gen. I think he's very genuinely in love um, with. Um, oh, what's her name? Um, oh, um, uh, Volcano yes. Mana. Um, so yes, we were Tanif. just talking about Tanif. Yeah, he's yeah. he's in completely besotted with Tanif. Yeah. Um, and like like at various points, you go for like, is this just fake? And he he almost like tries to frame it as fake, but it mm-hmm. clearly isn't. Like he yeah. really. He's genuinely... almost like surprised that he's feeling a genuine emotion for once. But he just <laughs> kind of like he kind of just shrugged. Like unlike the other worlds where he's still like doing his machinations and he's mm-hmm. trying to work his way up, and usually by screwing over a whole bunch of people, mm-hmm. he kind of just ends up shrugging at this one. Like like at a certain point, it's like. Yeah, this is yeah. this is what it is. Like, yeah. like it's too much for for, for poor patches. <laughs> like, Elden Rings overwhelms him. I think, which um, is ironic, really, when you consider what he's like in Dark Souls Three. I mean, have you ever seen the the uh, extension, the um, the Ringed City DLC of Dark Souls Three? I haven't got to Dark Souls Three because I was playing Dark Souls. So I finished Dark Souls One with my brother in a in a playthrough. Um, he sort of dragged me through it. It was like <laughs> the first Souls experience yeah. proper. I mean, I tried it previously, um, and then we got to about halfway through Dark Souls Two, which we were really enjoying. And then the the I don't know if it's been fixed now, but the um, the the multiplayer failed. The the whole oh. um, yeah, because they had that massive or maybe still do because i haven't checked recently um that massive um failure of their system basically yes. i my my understanding of the story i don't know if this is true but my understanding of the story is that somebody revealed that there was a hack in it that could be used to um take over people's computers oh. and he'd been warning them about this for ages and they were ignoring him and so um to get them to stop ignoring him so that, that something awful wouldn't happen someone's computer wasn't taken from them mm-hmm. um you know it'll, have lose all of their like financial information or whatnot yeah, um, yeah he 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 um hacked someone's account during a live during a, a very popular like live players person's account during their live play right. to show that it could be done um and the person wasn't angry like he, he kind of got why he did it yeah like, yeah yeah and they were sort of completely on good terms and then they like oh fuck it's real like but they just pulled it um, this is my understanding i i do not want to absolutely say it's true but i've heard this is what happened so and i, I as far as i understand it hasn't been put back up like it's basically been down just a little oh, since before elden rings um came out i i, I might have come back up it would be i'd certainly oh, be I glad don't. if it was was because I, i'd be glad to get back to yeah, my let's play of, of, if yeah. there's one of the dark souls games you need the multiplayer for it's Dark Souls too. There, there are fights in that I still can't do on my own. Oh, it's it's a pain. Like I, I, I just enjoyed playing through the first one and most of the second one, with my <laughs> brother. So it'd be nice to finish the whole series. Oh, I mean, don't get me wrong. I, yeah. I really did enjoy Dark Souls too. It's, it's the least mm. popular of the games because yeah, it is, it is the most unbalanced. It's the one mm. where some of the fights are really cheap. They are. There's there's yeah. no getting around it. There's there's certain fights in that I never want to do again. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's understandable. I mean, I've I've already seen examples of that in the game where uh, I, my brother's very knowledgeable about the the Souls games, so he could sort of like prepare me for each yeah. fight ahead and stuff. Um, but yeah, like there are certain like moments in 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 the game where um like yeah, it just didn't feel as satisfying but i do i just like the world of El- me of El- too of, i mean of, of that's dark souls 2 and... that's one of the most frustrating things like the world of dark souls 2 is amazing mm, mm. it does stuff with the lore and the mythology that is beautiful and some of the individual encounters are some of the best in the whole series yeah yeah there are fights in like particularly the dlc i will i will go out on a limb and i will say that the dark souls 2 probably has the best dlc of any game from soft have done mm. there are three bits of dlc and they are 
all amazing they're massive they expand the world beautifully they change the nature of the game they introduce story arcs that didn't exist in the main game they introduce endings that didn't exist in the main game and they even expand mm. the lore and mythology of the first game because it refers back to stuff that happened in the original game it's so good there's a fight I'm, 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 sorry go sorry on. go on no 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 go on no 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 okay i, I was just gonna say on the subject of dlc we hope they do a DLC for um, for Elden Ring that that gives you um, Kenneth Height's story because like oh, that's I one of like so. yeah that I hope would so. be because I, I, I liked chatting with Sir Kenneth. Yeah, I mean uh, he kind of just he gets in that castle and it has this sort of like I wouldn't even mind him having like a bad ending. I mean that's right, fairly right. predictable, but like like it's just kind of a non-ending. Like, it is, sad, isn't it? He gets sort of a non right. He just sort of like. Yeah stops doesn't he it's it's yeah. one of those characters that feels like it's maybe a little bit incomplete yeah. um yeah. there's there's there have been rumblings of uh, of dlc for elden ring for a long time now and uh, from what i understand that is in production yeah i mean i would i would be surprised if they didn't come out with a, a dlc for elden ring of some form i mean i i i understand like so the the, the other plot line that isn't finished is um the Nephili Lou um, and Gatekeeper Gostuk uh, mm-hmm. plotline because it's implied that um, so I gathered that there's like background stuff and and stuff that didn't get into the game that sort of yeah. people have uncovered that that suggests that they are both um, uh, children of um, of Godfrey. Um, so I and, understand, yeah, yeah, um, and that they're kind of basically rival potential replacements for godfrey um Mm -hmm. and you got you got kind of an interesting like moral like opposition there between the sort of i mean nephili is obviously like one of the uh, more noble characters of the game um being screwed over by gideon but then who isn't (laughs) who isn't Um, everyone who interacts with gideon is screwed over by him quite frankly and a gatekeeper gastro who is just like the most self-serving worm indian <laughs> so like there's some brilliant aspects to that character uh-huh. um like how um uh if um if you um if you die in um in the castle in stormvale castle uh-huh. um Every time you come back, you have a very you have lost a small amount, and you recover your um oh what do they what are they called your runes um, your, your runes, runes. Yeah. Yes, runes in this game I'm always trying to yeah. I always call them souls yeah. or, or, or yes. blood echoes I've even called them blood echoes <laughs> at, at points understand because they're essentially the same thing it's the yes. same stuff yes, yes. absolutely yeah. it is. but if you lose your, your runes and you recover them there's some missing. Yeah, and if you he kill them, him, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah, if you kill him, they stop going missing. So he's like out there stealing your runes every uh, your runes every time you die. Um, he also like sets you up at the beginning, of like he sends he you does. down that path to get killed. Um, and and then he sort of like yeah, I mean he's he obviously like takes credit for you killing um yeah uh, yeah Godric, yeah Godric. So he is he is a He's very much Godric's progeny, like in every way. <laughs> like, every conceivable. Like he, he, Isn't he the one who slams the door on you as well inside Castle yes. Stormvale when you go oh, yeah, in that yeah, little you hear treasure laugh. room? You hear him laugh. Um, <laughs> he just, yeah. Like, arguably, like one of the few characters in the game who, in that exact way, is like nastier than patches yeah like, yeah at least I patches mean, is doing it for a reason like, yes, like patrick I mean, wants physical things usually yes he's just doing also, it because he's a sadist i mean patches is really weird in some of the games it's almost it's almost like religious the reason why he's doing this to you he he seems to suggest that it's like a certainly in bloodborne when he betrays you when he pushes you into the filth and whatnot he he claims that he's doing it to introduce you to the eldritch truths to introduce you to the amygdala the great Mm. god of whatever um so yes that's interesting in blood i'd love to finally play a bird one i really do hope they eventually bring out i I hope they do (laughs) i hope they do because it is a barring elden ring it is the best of these games Mm. it is uh, astonishing that game aesthetically it is very much like my thing like like yeah. that kind of yeah i mean i sort I, of I, so victorian steampunky yeah. but horror lovecraftian horror 
I oh. also like Victoriana that problematizes Victoriana. Like the problem with oh, a lot of Victoriana God. is it's just cutesy nonsense. Yeah. Whereas like Victoriana that like leads lends into the heart. I mean, because so much about um, Bloodborne, from what I've seen of like Let's Plays, is like about um, the the sort of rapaciousness of this place mm-hmm. and its excessiveness, yeah. and that like feeds into themes of colonialism mm-hmm. and and like the guilt of the colonizers. Oh, that um, that is replete yeah. in blood. That is absolutely one of mm. like the core themes of Bloodborne. Mm. And I I love that. Like I think if you're going to handle Victoriana, you have to do it that way. It, yeah, you've got to address it, sense. don't you? Yeah. You've got to address yeah. it in some way, shape, or form. And I would say Bloodborne absolutely goes there. It doesn't just it doesn't just err on the side of the aesthetics of Victoriana, which is very easy to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just comes empty if you're not going to engage with those deeper themes, because then it's just sort of like it's kind of a museum piece, and you know, something kind of yeah. robbed of its cultural and historical context and, yep. and becomes kind of atomized from itself yeah it's almost like a cartoon um, isn't it you know there's something mm-hmm. very very two-dimensional and lacking about it yeah exactly yeah and 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 like combining that with a kind of um sort of post lovecraftian lovecraft is, is yeah, like really, yeah. yeah very clever um, very clever yeah. stuff <laughs> um yeah Oh, I mean, it is beautiful. I mean, Bloodborne, it's got, for, uh, barring Elden Ring, which it, Elden Ring, it, it really does incorporate everything from before. It's almost like mm-hmm. the games that have gone before are the experiments, the test beds for ideas. And then Elden Ring is really where they effloresce, where everything comes together. But mm-hmm. blo- barring Elden Ring, Bloodborne has the most beautiful mythology. I, I just can't, mm-hmm. honestly cannot get over how cool it is. Yeah, I mean, it perhaps maybe even more than Elden Ring, from what I gather, leans into the sort of lies upon lies trick. Yeah, like, that well, is like, that that yeah. is the, the the very core of the metaphysics of Bloodborne is exactly that. It's exactly that. So there's no there's no such thing as like lies and truth in Bloodborne. There really isn't. There's no such thing as dreams and waking. It's almost like there are there are dreams upon dreams upon dreams upon dreams in tears, and each of uh, dreams are basically synonymous with reality. Yeah, I mean it's almost like in a sort of um, a kind of uh, Gnostic sense of being like trapped in one of the lower animations. Like, yeah, like you're like you're sort of yeah, and you're you're so far away from anything like uh, a spiritual reality that mm-hmm. isn't even conceivable to you. That that is, is yeah, that is it essentially. Especially yeah. in the uh, the DLC for Bloodborne, the Old Hunters. I mean, one of the things you have to do in the Old Hunters is you pass through various levels and layers of dreaming through the the, the hunter's nightmare mm. and as you rise through them you you discover more about the hidden truths of what's happening in in Yarnum and also what that means in the wider metaphysics it's pretty um, i mean it's completely nihilistic and dark yeah. and very very unpleasant but also amazing in scope i mean just like- incredible in scope the game mechanically implies that knowledge is bad right because the oh, yeah. more insight you get the more of the like literally the more monsters you see and yep. monsters become more powerful because mm-hmm. you couldn't see their powers before yep. and seeing their powers actually gives them their powers like That's they don't have those right. abilities unless you can see them that is so absolutely actually, right yeah and the more threat uh, yeah. the more you know the more um, ignorant you are and the yeah. less sort of, I suppose, uh, you know, in game terms, the less elevated you are, the better off you are. Yeah, but that's that's such a brilliant way to do a kind of Lovecraftian metaphysics. Like it's just that's a very um, it's a very elegant way um, mechanically to handle that. Oh, it's. Beautiful. I also like like the element of things literally sucking your insight away from you, which yes. in certain circumstances can be a good thing it can be a good thing can be useful something like remove your insight yeah. from you remove your literally like suck your knowledge out of yeah. your head if um, um if you were going for that if, the, if you wanted to pass through certain areas of the game and you wanted lower insight so that they didn't deal as much damage to you or even like some enemies just don't even occur if you don't have the insight um sufficient to make them manifest then finding one of those leech-headed cthulhuoid things that sucks your insight out would actually be really useful mm. 
it's it's just that's quite brilliant to like make a game that that has that kind of dynamic oh. that's written into the mechanics of the game that isn't just told to you through no, some it's, expository dump. It's yeah. utterly brilliant. I mean, that is one of my favorite things about the game. When I discovered that, I was elated. I was absolutely mm. elated. And the fact that you can go back once you've reached a certain level of insight, you can go back through the game and things change. Mm-hmm. You see things that weren't there anymore. You even hear things that you didn't hear before. Oh, that's oh. brilliant. Yeah, like the auditory stuff. I mean, that game has such a, a great soundscape already. I mean, oh, music it's... wise, but also just like background sounds and such. One of the things that yeah. really, really, I mean, I, I found this amazing. As as you play the game, you do discover that part of the, the running narrative is about a very particular great one an infant great one and the great ones are basically like they are in lovecraft they're the old ones they the outer gods effectively an outer god called murgo and murgo is this infant outer god an infant great one Mm. who's been sealed away in a particular pocket of nightmare reality that was synthetically created by a, a cult in yarnum and if you have enough insight throughout the game you can hear him you can hear murgo mm. crying and you can hear murgo's lullaby which is the the it's the un, it's basically the concurrent theme throughout the game and That's it's, it's yeah utterly utterly I, amazing i remember when i saw murgo in, in your last play uh, mm. he reminded me just instantly of certain um Oh, uh, Zdzislaw Bixinski pictures. The sort yeah. of because uh, Zdzislaw Bixinski has a lot of those sort of. Um, I guess they're very uh, sort of semi-Christian. I mean, Bixinski does this thing of like using Christian imagery in in completely non-Christian mm-hmm. contextual ways. So like you have like the forms of like cross and and like an mm-hmm. emaciated figure on it but there's no like way to decode it that makes sense of it and he has a lots of ones of like babies in cribs with like blue robed women uh-huh. or women like creatures sort of over the top of them and that was i just immediately thought of like like one of those um paintings by Bixinski when i saw very um, much so yeah very much yeah, it has so. that it's, it's it's not just like the the sort of superficial trappings. There's like a mood that it has in common. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, a yeah. lot of the storytelling I would say in Bloodborne is atmospheric. A significant mm. amount of the storytelling is atmospheric. It's a, I mean, it's an incredibly oppressive game, more so than any of even the Dark Souls games. I mean, like one thing because I played Bloodborne first. I just played them all ass backwards, all of them ass backwards. So it was Bloodborne, Dark Souls three, <laughs> Dark Souls one, Dark Souls two, and Elden Ring. <laughs> It's just crazy, <laughs> crazy way of playing these games. Um, but the color palette, what really shocked me about playing Dark Souls for the first time is how colorful it is compared to Bloodborne. Mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I mean, Elden Ring is, is deceptive in that. I mean, that's oh. like uh, the whole thing. Like, like everything about... I mean, especially that initial impression you get when you come out or uh, into oh, I was, the, I was the, the world. I was um, old. I, I stopped and, playing in my Let's Play, and you can hear me on the recording just, like, gasping mm, at how beautiful mm. it all is. And there's a sense in which... Um, I mean, the Golden Order has failed, and, and that <laughs> kind of just means that the sort of Lindell and the capital city has failed, and it is a kind of ruin to itself, but it's also just so splendidly preserved yeah and it still has all of this life in it and the vitality of that world there's lots of places that kind of reveal that it's a lie i mean the witch village Mm -hmm. is is an obvious example and of course the the fact that it's all on top of this civilization that's been Mm -hmm. just erased i mean in a very like atlantean sort of like (laughs) very much like 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 this was and not even like punished for hubris but just punished because it didn't correspond to the yep. designs of this ancient outer mm-hmm. being that doesn't even come from that planet um it's yeah i mean it's it's very twisted but it takes so long to get to, i mean of course also lindell just represents that very like literally we're like having this just horrific sewer system that it's built on top of that it's got this you know that the, that's where like the dung eater lives uh-huh. that's where the omens are uh, are placed um it's got this kind of like very literal like festering underbelly yeah. there's even suggestions of that corruption rising up into lane there are areas mm. that are 
covered in like like a sort of fungal filth and areas that are desert there are areas where like the life has been sapped away there's even one of the corrupted tree spirits in one of the districts yes yes there is yeah yeah and and i mean like which is a really interesting thing to have there of all places like yeah. right beside the actual tree like right right like, i yeah. mean that suggests that the the corruption is right close right it's mm. it's getting to the roots of this thing and that gets at one of the um subplots i've never played but probably will eventually which is the golden masks um storyline um mm-hmm. gold mask yeah not golden mask um and like like i gather his whole thing is like that he sees that corruption in in um the golden order mm-hmm. and wants to essentially recreate it and to purify it yeah it's kind of like a he's kind of like a more orthodox than the orthodox like he's <laughs> yeah. like trying he's tr- yeah, I, yeah but like also he never talks so his whole thing like he's absolutely silent he just sort of points towards he just the points tree. yeah yeah and everything is communicated um via the cleric that you meet in in um the round table place mm-hmm. um Oh, what's that cleric? Called? I can never remember um, his name because I never followed his plot. I just, I just went to him for to give him the scrolls and have him moan. You know, he goes slowly mad as as he realizes that like Gold Mask, who is his absolute idol, mm-hmm. um, is not following <laughs> quite the 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 prescribed path that, ah. that was in. The, but he's kind of like by the time he realizes that, I guess he's in too deep. Like, this, yeah. just nothing he can do so he just becomes absolutely despairing oh. um, he has a very bad ending to put it. oh i haven't yeah. i haven't found it yet i mean my uh, the the gold mask guy still stood on the edge of the bridge pointing at the tree for me at the moment you have to uh, you have to find corin and follow his plot for the gold mask to make any sense because i'm always uh. just, and this is what happened for me i haven't played corin's plot i've just sort of seen stuff of people who have <laughs> Um, and you've got to follow a very exact line with him. Um, so after he leaves the golden, uh, the, 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 um, the round table, mm-hmm. you've got to find him and then you've got to follow him along his journey. And he starts appearing with gold mask. And different right. Things. Got you. Eventually he gets into like the icy area where, where the, where the last fire giant is. And that's mm-hmm. where he starts. Well, it's going there that finally does it for him because he's like, well, like we're we're the we're the you know the true believers, but we're in this place that's yeah. utterly blasphemous, and we're not supposed to be here. So why yeah. has Gold Mask led me here? Like, and you can basically Ooh. like you can basically like tell him like, oh, it's probably all for the good, and he'll just call you on your bullshit. You can mm-hmm. even offer him <laughs> um, the the forget the forgetting vial um, so that he oh. can go back, and he'll refuse it. He says there's no point because I'll just end up back here again. Yeah, but you can oh. offer it to him. Wow. Um, Apparently, there's a few characters. I haven't done this myself. I've seen sort of clips, but you, there's a few characters you can offer the forgetting vial to. Um, they mostly refuse. I think a couple of them say yes, um, and and he's one of them. Um, I think um, D's brother might be one. I might be wrong about that, oh. but I think he might be one. But there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Basically, people who have like done because something of what terrible you know, they're kind of screwed yeah like yeah. <laughs> like or something terrible has been done to them or yeah yeah or they feel betrayed or something like that um and you can and you can offer it to them as an alternative um to oh, that's offering very it cool I, I had um, no idea that that had application outside of um like tanith and um oh uh, i can never remember her name but the the lizard lady who i like very Raya. much Right, Raya, right, that's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's yeah, and like there's, there's. I mean, there's so many things like that. Like you'll never. I mean, one of my favorites is is around. Um, oh, uh, Bok the uh, the seamster. Yeah. Um, because Bok has a a really like, Bok has a really interesting plot line, and actually one of the, potentially one of the least tragic, although also potentially one of the most tragic. Because ah. <laughs> Bok has all has this thing about. Um, uh, you know, obviously, he he hates being a demi-human. He wants mm-hmm. to be a human. Um, he he um, regards himself as grotesque, but he also has this like fondness for his mother, uh, nice. and a fondness for you, which seems kind of like uh, like odd because like you don't really do very much to I mean, you save his little um, 
figure you let him follow him around and be your seamster, mm-hmm. but like otherwise you don't really do very much for him. He doesn't really do much for you either because the second you get his ability, you can also just do it yourself. I was going to say you can't um, do it yourself, can't you? And, so. he, <laughs> and he gets kind of angry if you do, like not angry, angry, but he's like, 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 please, master, I can do this for you. There's no reason for you to be like mending you. You know, you're too good to be mending your own clothes. Um, <laughs> is how he frames it. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> but you um you can get uh one of those vo- you know how you can get those voice things that allow you to like speak through them and you can say certain things yeah yeah um and one of them i think it says like i love you or no it says you're beautiful um and if you use that around him that's he he regards that as his mother's voice which oh. makes you wonder where those things come from and if they're actually like part of this like queen of the sub demi humans because it's kind of suggested mm. that maybe all of the demi humans have one mother yeah. um um so if you use the the voice thing on him um he stops thinking of himself as ugly because he remembers that his mother regarded him as beautiful uh, and he no longer wants to change and he just becomes happy for the rest of the game oh. alternatively he asks for one of the um transformational things that you need to give to oh, Renala. To yeah um and if you give him it he'll go to Renala to become a human and you'll find him then again as a human but he's completely mute he says nothing he just looks vacantly in front of himself like he's been emptied out oh. and then if you come back again he's he's still a human but he's dead now um so like obviously transforming him to a human did not take very did well. not work very um, well oh no <laughs> so like yeah like that, that but that's like that's all like that whole thing is dependent on very i mean either of those paths are dependent on on like having very particular items at particular yep. points in the game and having particular dialogues and also like like the voice thing literally like i would not Just have worked that out by myself no i mean i, I worked that out from you, right like i mean i did do that but i did it after watching a video like you have to like like use a voice thing next to Bach like why I, would you, why do would that? you even <laughs> conceive of doing that I know yeah. there's so much of the game that's like that though and this this seems to be the way FromSoft just des- design their games there's this real old fashioned adventure game quality to them mm. where they're, they're esoteric right you just have to you either have to know <laughs> you just have to know because of a walkthrough or something to that effect or you happen across them by complete blind luck or chance yeah yeah i mean like and it creates this fantastic mythology around the game where like you're never sure like what elements might still yeah. be in the game that are, are as i know almost are certainly elements because there's stuff as random as the box stuff there's got to be right stuff there's bound to be more. i i imagine yeah. there's tons of stuff that no one's yeah. ever 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 discovered and i know mm. it's the kind of game where people are going to be discovering things for decades to come mm. i guarantee you there's going to be there will be uh, we will be reading articles you know 20 <laughs> years from now oh this has been discovered in elden ring mm, mm. i mean there's just such, so many like little elements that feel like they can go more places as well i mean some of that obviously is going to be dlc i, I mean mm-hmm. I, as i said I, I expect the the whole plot around um the the um successes to godfrey is going to be yeah very likely a deal yeah that that feels that feels like it's going to be doesn't it that feels like a an obvious lead into another narrative i also think like it it connects to so many other elements that don't go anywhere as well like preceptor selvis's plot obviously connects to Nephilim, but it it connects to her but doesn't do anything like nothing happens around (laughs) it um and i like i i mean it's one of the few times where gideon off Ophnia kind of deserves a little bit of a pat on the back because he <laughs> hates um selfies yeah, and he allows means, you to screw him over. He yeah, there's uh, over some accord yeah. there, at least, isn't there? Yeah. And we can both agree on that. Yes, Absolutely. I mean, Saluvis is a piece of shit. So I mean, yeah. Like the difference between them is like like Gideon Ophnia is definitely the worst human being between them, but mm-hmm. Saluvis is less like the most intensely unlikable yes person. he's immediately <laughs> unlikable isn't he he's yeah. i mean at the very least ofnia ofnia is pers- he's charismatic yes absolutely he's very charismatic. he will engage with yeah. you without insulting you won't he yeah, um, yeah. whereas saluvis just won't saluvis is just unpleasant mm-hmm. Yeah, at least as long as he thinks. I mean, with off you know, at least as long as he thinks he can get something from you. Like, yes. Yeah, like like when you're Latin and you're just holding something that he wants, he'll just kill your dog and leave yeah, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, otherwise, uh, that is that is one of the like like yeah, the fact that you can become so emo- emotionally invested in the dead wolf that you never see alive as well is, is know, quite yeah. I know. It's, yeah. It's, <laughs> it's incredible. It's ridiculous. I mean, it's, but... it's the whole Albaneric setup though, because of course they they can't they lose a, the use of their legs, so their wolves are literally mm-hmm. how they move around. So like she's yeah. literally rendered like completely unable to move by what he does it's it's even, like yeah a, yeah it's even more like, cruel than what it initially seems to be isn't it yeah that's exactly it like like there are characters who are like framed as more evil like shabriri is a good example hmm. but like i mean shabriri like his main thing is to like convince you that going down the path of the three fingers is necessary because it's your only way of of saving um melina yeah and otherwise right. you're like a selfish asshole and that's just like an outright lie because like i i whatever the hell happens with melina through like the weird burning thing like mm-hmm. a that is clearly what she wants oh um, yeah be, it's what she's working towards from the very beginning yeah. isn't it you know i in no way think she's dead like like i <sighs> like that's a that's a uh, a transcendence moment not absolutely moment. yeah i mean it doesn't yeah. even seem to like burn her in a traditional sense it kindles around her but it doesn't like yeah. burn her to ashes or anything like that she seems to almost become part of the flame which i think is yeah. kind of, like i think she's i think she's like incorporating into the tree somehow or something yeah. like that um but it's clearly like like her whole agenda. Um, yeah. I mean, she lies to you, obviously, because mm-hmm. she knew from the beginning that you would need to burn the tree, and she just sort of sets you on your way, thinking, yeah. "Oh, you know, la di da, beat some bosses, la di da, ah, oh, now I'm the Elden <laughs> Lord." <And> like, like, <laughs> like, 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 she knows that you're going to get to the tree, and is like, "Nope, like, no, nope, like, can't get in." So, op- yeah, turns out Not loads of it. people have gotten this far, but like. There's just nothing you can do. Yeah, they just haven't. Uh, yeah, they just had to turn away and go back. Yeah, <laughs> and, and like she just absolutely sets you up for that. Um, yeah. So she's got her own kind of. Uh, I mean, she's got also some kind of weird relationship with um, with um, Rani. Um, yes, as well. I don't know like, quite like, what. I mean, some people think that they're, they're they're almost like aspects of the same entity somehow because they 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 do look very similar don't they there's almost like a sisterly or i don't know like a uh, two aspects of the same goddess going on Mm. i mean there's bits of melania that that connect like the 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 kind of powers that she uses i think and and also like her tattoo yeah um, have like aspects of the three fingers which is weird because she is like I mean, she is the one when you first, when you actually try to join the Three Fingers, she will actually come in oh, and give you will. a full-on intervention. Oh, She'll yeah, be like, she will tell like, you not to do it. <laughs> yeah, like, 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 have you considered not being a nihilist? Is yeah, kind of like yeah. the tone of it. Like, <laughs> like, 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 sure, things are crap, but like, maybe burning the entire universe down is an overreaction. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> But yeah, like, like, I mean, uh, so she's clearly not of the three fingers variety, but she's got all of these like three finger kind of core. But I, her agenda remained, and I it's kind of like this very, completely it enigmatic. Is, it is, isn't it? It's almost inscrutable as to what, what exactly she a what she is and what she ultimately is trying to do, hmm. because you know, you becoming Elden Lord and all of that gubbins saving reality or whatnot seems to be almost incidental compared to her wanting to burn and wanting to be part of the burning of the tree yeah yeah that's that's the agenda the rest is kind of and i mean i think like whatever her agenda is clearly goes beyond the particular cycle you're in like i think that's what's implied like she's got an esoteric sort of agenda that is just probably like i mean again like like um rihanna the rich like just beyond your concept rani the rich yeah. like, beyond your conception beyond maybe it's a your... similar thing maybe she's yeah. trying to ascend in a in a different via a different path you know or maybe she is or she either is or is an agent or an avatar of one of the outer gods trying to influence mm. things i mean possibly like she does have this kind of consistent like anti-meddling thing that's another thing she has in common with rani like mm-hmm. that she's kind of there's kind of an element where she seems genuinely sick of all of the yeah. outer god meddling i mean like it's it's 
I mean, there's so many as well. Like, it's heavily implied that even um, I've forgotten the name again. The the scorpion uh, being um, oh, Astel, yeah. Ast- even Astel is like one of these outer gods who's just trying to like right. meddle in. It's almost in, like, in, like it feels like what's happening is this dying world is attracting parasite mm. gods and demigods like a you know like a corpse, right? Mm. Mm, I think so. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's because like the world has already been parasited on by this Elden beast, mm. and this and these other beings um, have either been defeated by the Elden beast previously when they attempted to sort of um, go in, which I think is, mm. is kind of what happens, you know, with most of the things that are underground. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> um, or, or alternatively, are, are exactly as you say, like like sensing that the Elden beast power is waning the like yeah. you know i mean that's definitely the impression that um the finger readers and Enya in particular um overwhelmingly give you that like mm-hmm. like they're sort of the the voice of the two fingers and they're like yeah it's 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 abandoned this world it's brilliant uh, isn't it what i loved yeah. was i i'm all i was all the way through the game i was absolutely amazed at how how people abandon or twi- or allow their ideologies to be subverted or bent or broken completely and mm. kind of run with it. They kind of run with it because there's nothing, there's no other choice. Enyu is an absolute uh, example of that. Um, I was really sad when she died. Yeah. Um, but like, like Enyu is sort of just like at the end, cause she goes, she does go on like an ideological journey, but she just doesn't let you in on, the internal process yes. of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she's clearly changing her mind at various points. And when you go, like, say, like, well, I'm just going to have to burn the earth tree. She's like, oh, that's blasphemy, but what well, can you do? Well, like, and, and like yeah. earlier on, she's like, like the two fingers are absolute. We have to follow their word at every point. And then you suggest like committing the ultimate blasphemy. She's like, you know, it's been a very long time. I'm, I'm about sick of this. Like, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you know, you everything about her bespeaks that, doesn't she? I mean, the yeah. way she's all sort of gnarled up, and she's ancient, and she's eyeless, and she's had enough, right? Almost yeah. that sense that you get from almost everyone you encounter in this game everyone has had enough yeah yeah and there's a whole bunch of characters that are like very particularly like that i mean fears like that like yeah like you almost get the sense like like fears like very bloody vengeance against d and and all that like she's just kind of sick of it yeah, <laughs> like it's had, just, yeah. yeah. the endless cycles of of prophecy and of rebirth and whatever they just don't care anymore they want some kind of ending mm. even if it, if they have to break the universe to do it or even if they have to die like, i mean sorcerer sorcerer roger i think is very oh, i mean it's I love... hard to say what's going on with him but he's like yeah i mean he's clearly aware that what he's doing is not going to be good for him <laughs> oh yeah i mean especially when he starts to i mean you don't it's hard to tell what happens to him ultimately isn't it but he starts to transform doesn't he yeah there's he something kind of, very wrong with him at one point when he's in the round table hold. <laughs> What's interesting though is like D is like, oh, he used to be my friend, and then he started consorting with they who live in death, and this is the mm-hmm. pathetic state that you end up with it uh, in. I just say, at no point is D more convincing than Roger, even as Roger is like rotting into the ground. Yeah. He's still more persuasive um, than <laughs> D. Yeah, um, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> like D just seems hopelessly deluded. Like, it, yeah. like even the second you meet him, he seems hopelessly deluded. I mean, for starters, he's like, "I am serving the uncorrupted order," and then you go and meet the the being he's serving, and it's mm. the beast clergyman Garank or something. Yeah. Like, like who, who it, at one point attacks you just because he loses his mind. With he, yeah, he goes mad, doesn't he? He loses. I, I was so shocked at that. I was like, "What's mm. going on?" Yeah, and then he's like, oh, enough, enough, I've I've regained my sense. Yes, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's like, <laughs> yeah, right. right. He's in a know. very pathetic situation. Like, like, and this is like who D is serving over and above, like, they who mm-hmm. live in death. It's like, kind of, they who live in glass houses, kind of. Territory. Yeah, you, you've hitched your car to the wrong horse there, <laughs> methinks. You know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, also like like I I love I love these armor. These armor is one. Of oh, it's my, amazing, my yeah. isn't it? It's beautiful. Yeah. 
And it's got so this strange. incredible melancholy to it with like the weeping head that's wrapped, like with the body that's wrapped around wrapped the other around, body. Like the it's weep, embracing. Head, and, yeah. Oh, it's oh so beautiful, but strange as hell. Mm. Very impractical mm. as much of the armor in Elton. Yes. Yeah. I think if you tried to actually fight in like a good number of the suits in this mm. game, you would you would have issues. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah, I, are... I feel I've been quite conservative with my outfits thus far. I just look like a wizard. <laughs> oh, I, I love dressing up in this game, so I, I would even wear things that were completely like not suited to my character <laughs> just to like mix things up. Oh, it's a whole um, thing, isn't it? It's a yeah. whole subculture. I mean, people do this all over YouTube. There's a there's a whole event, isn't there, where people get together like on Elden Ring but in multiplayer to show one another their, their different outfits that they've put together and whatnot. It's, it's a fantastic you can do some really incredible, especially because some of the suits are so OTT that if you put like a very particular part of like say um, Silvarius's hat with like a dung eater like, like armor or something like that, yeah. like it just comes across as really weird. Uh, I mean, yeah. not to mention that like, you've got things like you can literally wear Blythe's face um, <laughs> with that. Um, Shabriri's hat is great. I think you can get gold masks uh, mask, which is fantastic um <laughs> i love wearing Jiren's outfit that sort of clown outfit um, oh yes so the yeah. sort of motley that he's got yeah. yeah i like that i mean i mean i mean you can get i mean like rihanna's like like just like mm, the full out kind of yeah yeah people like create like a gandalf type character with the hat and then the yeah. different robe <laughs> the and, like, massive they have, like, hat. A big beard yeah <laughs> if you've got like a big beard coming beneath that hat you can sort of go full gandalf yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> but there are there are so many different like strange outfits, and you get pretty much everyone's outfit. I mean, like like like, and because you can do multiple playthroughs, of course, you mm-hmm. can like play the whole game with anyone's outfit. So you can you can meet Gideon Offnir as Gideon Offnir yeah, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Where, you know, get but, Renala's yeah. ridiculous curved hat or whatever. Yeah. As long as it's humanoid, like sadly you can't go around the game looking like um like a, a, a turtle pope. That's um, a shame. That would be fun. Yeah. That, that would be fun. be fun. But how yeah. you would how you would ever program that, I don't know. <laughs> you'd have to, you just have to have like like physics breaking moments, yeah. I think, for it to Yeah. Definitely. But, yeah, there's there's some like things you can't get. I, I was really sad that I don't think at least as far as I'm aware, you can't get the instrument that the nomadic merchants have no um, that they can so use I as don't a bow. think you can um, get that no i mean that's it's, it's it's i mean like have you i mean you you played to like their area where you discover all of the dead ones. Oh, all of the like, dead ones yeah, yeah, yeah that was so yeah. disturbing yeah there's so many of these like implied genocides like the, the albanerics but like obviously even before the albanerics were being wiped out the merchants um mm-hmm. they, they've got a name that they're sort of tribe of merchants yeah of, um, um i can't remember but you find them yeah. all underneath um Oh, where are they? They're in like a dungeon, aren't they? Underneath. Um... Yeah, they're they're in that secret area beneath Lindel, I think. That's and, and right. That's, that's right. where you get to the Free Fingers. So that's like, right. Yeah, and I think basically they were, I think they they kind of fled to the Free Fingers because of the oppression, and then they were just exterminated by the yeah. Golden Order. I think is the implication. Um, the Golden Order has committed a fair few genocides, I think it is mm. safe to say. Um, yeah. There are quite a yeah. few that you discover along the way, aren't there? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's like there's a there's a there's a reason like like some of the children of the Golden Order came to think that they may be not the best. Mm. Thing. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> because they're not. I mean, they're just no. like, 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 like even other like particularly disturbing factions. Like the Moon Order isn't like benevolent but like but just, not by a significant yeah. margin i mean mo- a lot of the time when you encounter them they're waging war on someone or other well they're mostly waging because there's the the carrion that's what the family Car- and royals and the, yeah yeah and of course they're, they're sort of intricately linked because they come together so basically before um the um rea lacaria came together with the golden order as a sort of marriage of convenience mm-hmm. um 
the Carian royal family and Rhea Lucaria were separate sects that came together. And then I think the failure of everything sort of split them apart again. It split and, them and apart also, again. Yeah, so when yeah. you find the Carian manor where the, the, the nobles lived, you find evidence that Rhea Lucaria has basically been laying siege to it. Yeah. Very ineffectually, though. Very ineffectually, um, sending giant disembodied hands to attack it. That's very peculiar. It's 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 a strategy. The the hands are one of the most nightmare fuel things yeah. in the game. The fact that they like either I like that they, they either fall on you from like high places mm-hmm. or jump out at you from the floor. Like like you yeah. never like I remember when I first hit that area and I was like is it even possible to do this area? Like I was just like scouting around and be like every t- where I turn a hand either grabs me from below or grabs me from above <laughs> and then insta kills me. Like, like, you know, I was kind of like full on thinking, you know, m- maybe, maybe, maybe you're I not should've... meant to do this. <laughs> yeah. I, I was kind of like thinking like, like maybe the Welsh giant outside had a point um, <laughs> yeah. as, as Welsh giants are, are prone yeah. to. Um... It wasn't even the hands he was warning you about. It was that, that sort of like yeah, the, the, lance the... from above the, 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 the pillars of light that kill you. But once yeah. you get into the Carian manor, it, it is one of the harder areas at that point in the game. That's for sure. Yeah, the pillars of light actually turned out to be like a pretty, pretty easy. To be honest. Like, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think he's just actively like, don't go there because you know my mistress doesn't. Yes, want you she to. doesn't want you to be <laughs> yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. Like, like, yeah. I mean, Eiji's an interesting character because there's a kind of implication before he disappears that he he has like he's done things he severely regrets to put yes. it mildly. Yes, I like, mean, like, um, he has like this guilt. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously I mean, that's. Yeah, sorry. One on. of the things is that he he imprisons Blythe, of course, in the yeah. uh, the Ever Jail. Um, he feels terribly guilty about that, mm. and he he kind of thinks like maybe the ending of Blythe would not have happened in the way he did did it did if he hadn't, which I don't yeah. think is true. But I think yeah. there's also stuff about like stuff he did back when he was like pre pre his service to <laughs> um, Rani and 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 his sort of general service to the. Um, to the uh the Karens who are not mm-hmm. by any measure good people <laughs> no, um, no. <laughs> <laughs> i mean like yeah there's a the general implication is that like sorcerers ju- just do human experimentation that's what they do and it's what they pretty much done. yeah and like, also i mean like, when, around that entire continent that area you find carian knights and rea lucaria sorcerer knights all of whom are armed with magical weapons and whatnot it's almost as though you get you get the impression that the carians and rea lucaria have a little kind of like magical weapon industry going on where they're supplying all of the yeah. the, the armies and forces in the local area I mean, probably even explore, uh, you know, outside of the local area, because mm. in Lindell, you, you know, you, even you, you, you find like those kinds of magical things, and they have mm-hmm. to have come from, because they don't from... come from Lindell, because they're no, not, like they come from Rhea yeah. Lucaria, don't they? So yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's absolutely the case. And you find mercenary glintstone sorcerers all over the place. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they have like this kind of. They have this almost kind of like Christian um, missionary vibe to them. Like you find sometimes that they'll be like around the um, demi humans, yes, uh, and and you'll have like particular ones with particular helmets, and it's like like this this helmet is for those who who go to dangerous areas to convert the infidel and, <laughs> yes. and, and like like raise the primitive it's like 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 and, you, and i think there's a place where you even see one of them teaching demi humans like yes they're magic. Almost, yes they're almost like preaching to them aren't they yeah and the, and the, of course you meet a demi that's actually this is a fantastic bit of um of storytelling through the game um you meet one of the demi human kind of queen creatures mm-hmm. um and she's got a staff and she yes casts a spell she casts a spell on you um and then she tries to do it again and it fails and she then throws the staff <laughs> at you yes yes you i remember the that staff. the staff is unique because it allows people with incredibly low intelligence scores to cast rudimentary magic <laughs> and it's a gift by Rhea lucaria so like they're <laughs> Like they gave it to this this demi human to try and elevate them to try and civilize them, quote unquote. <laughs> um, I, mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's like funny and tragic at the same time. Like it's got like this like there's this really weird like 
Because of course, like, it's just that implied like the Demi humans are not like inferior humans. Like they're their whole separate culture, right, right. Um, that has like their own thing that are just kind of being screwed over left, right, and center by except, everyone. Yeah. Absolutely everyone. But it's also just a great little bit of storytelling, isn't it? It yeah. shows you like how Ray and Lucario are evangelizing across the world and interfering with people from yeah. within their little magical sanctum. Uh, it's very, very cool stuff, and it's just it's indicative of the kind of storytelling you find throughout this game. You could you could spend forever just just playing this game and you would get so much out of it it's yeah. as i said before it i feel a little bit ruined by it no it is hard to like like other games i mean it's kind of the first game since Baldur's gate 2 to really like this is a defining game for yeah. me like like oh, yeah. yeah um like there's just i mean even like the stuff we've touched on is like surface oh my like god the tip like... of the iceberg i mean we've been talking yeah. for nearly three hours now and it's it's tip of the iceberg yeah i i it's, it's very difficult to emphasize to people just the depths that this mm. game goes to um yeah. it, it really is something you kind of have to experience for yourselves mm. i mean it is it is like in book equivalence it's like an epic it, it does yeah. have that sort of scope um and scale and and just a number of like moving pieces like there's just so many different moving pieces in this mm -hmm. world um and yeah like yeah it is just something else um, if you i mean if you want an example of just what it's like go and check out some of the youtube and uh, channels out there like vati vidya and whatnot who try who apply interpretation to games like Elden Ring and how extensive their videos are. They're, they're just enormous. They've done entire series on the previous games, you know, on Dark Souls and Bloodborne and whatnot. With Elden Ring, they've got years of content. I mean, literally yeah. years of content ahead of them. Because it's so interpretative, it's just it's just not ending. Like like there's just no reason to stop because you nope. can have like rival theories to Yeah, explain. of course everything like there's some like bare elements that have to be but like that's that's very surface oh yeah i mean interpreting these get this game like a text as you would uh, like in a, an english literature class or whatever would be an absolute joy mm -hmm. no it's it 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 is it is a fun game just i mean that's why um it works so well because of that like the way you get in mesh like it the mechanics and i mean we talked before about like everything feeding back into story mm -hmm. um the mechanics and 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 the way that it operates i just tell this just massive magisterial um account of this semi-dying rebirthing sort of world yeah it's um, very i mean it, it's and everything is so open to interpretation is that including the world itself like what is the condition of I mean, the lands it, between even its links to the other games is mm -hmm. just like you could just i mean you can go anywhere from there are no links like 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 somehow um this one guy patches can just transcend all worlds, but <laughs> otherwise there's just like no links, or, or, or maybe it's like an ancestor, or, or yeah, or it could be I mean, in the future of yeah, or so, um, or maybe it's like one of the many worlds that the metaphysics of Bloodborne touches. You know, who knows? Maybe the end, like the Flame of Frenzy ending, is the beginning mm -hmm. of yeah. Dark Souls, right? That that seems to be like a that's a, I think that's quite a common one I think that's like it does suggest itself like that 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 is the kind of cannot but that that's interesting because that makes that the cannot the three fingers is the canonical ending in yeah, a sense then right which is really dark very um, interesting and also kind of goes to establish that the three fingers has the sort of like rebirth it it's sort of written into it that it is yeah. a sort of ending um ending. But yeah, like there are so many. I mean, like, I, like some of them, some of the links between different games in 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 the FromSoft games are kind of like more obvious. Like, I mm -hmm. I just straight up think unambiguously that, um, and I'm certainly not alone, that um, Bloodborne is a painted world. In, yes. Oh, abs um, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, personal head canon. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Um, the way Dark Souls Three sets up that very particular uh, metaphysics of the painted worlds, it makes it basically infinite. Yeah, yeah, and and also like it just makes sense for what 
Bloodborne is and yeah. why it is. You know, Bloodborne is essentially this experiment at transcending cycles. Yep. But there are no cycles in Bloodborne. So mm-hmm. what are the cycles that are trying to be transcended? Like it's a, it's right. about like like transcendence and it's about overcoming these like pre-given conditions, but you don't get why any of this is in mm. place. Um, and then if it's just an escape from the world of Dark Souls, and that, that just makes a lot of sense. Like, it like, does, like, doesn't it? It, it, yeah. it? it lends context to an otherwise very esoteric, perhaps even baffling metaphysical situation. Because you know, like, becoming a god just makes absolute sense if you're in Dark Souls, and your yeah. alternative to that is... Like it is like being a Dark Souls character is about as dire a phase you can get. Like I think oh, arguably yeah. one of the few worse fates than like being a Warhammer forty thousand character. Yeah, I mean at least in Warhammer forty thousand you can get out, you can die, which is fine. You can you can transcend into something else, like you can become a demon prince or something like that. There is potential, there's possibility. Largely in Dark Souls, there ain't. You are you are done, one it's way or like, the other. It's also like you, you're done, but then you get, come back and be done all over again. All like over again, yeah. The same tragedy eight, <laughs> in eight billion variations. Yeah. Um, oh. Like the universe is never really done with screwing with you in Dark no. Souls. No, it isn't. There's no you're absolutely real right. real reason for it because whatever machinations are going on behind the scenes, they're kind of indifferent. Yep. to you as well so or you're dead kind of being, you know that's the yeah. other implication that, that it's not e- there isn't even like a a real design or intention for these metaphysics it's it's just churning on endlessly for no reason well, it's like the world was designed by some malignant entity but then that entity faded and now yep. it's just auto running that mm-hmm. same I mean, that kind of feels like the two fingers, which is yeah. defined in this game by its absence. Like, yeah, right. Like, most of the two fingers you encounter are dead. Obviously, it's a servant of this sort of greater being, but you never mm-hmm. have any direct, you know, mean- meaningful communication with yep. it. It sets you up on these bizarre paths. It, you almost get the feeling like it's done with this world. Maybe it's moved on oh, yeah. to a different world. Like, maybe it's out there, like, you know, sort of, um Skeksis fashion um draining another planet <laughs> yeah maybe it's had enough yeah right maybe these are just the remnants and that's it you know yeah, yeah. maybe it's not even considering this this reality anymore and it, it like that like a very easy reading like from especially what the finger readers tell you or yeah. the, the primary finger reader tells you and also the condition um, of the fingers when you could encounter yeah. them they're diseased they're they're bleeding you know mm, mm. yeah you, they're, they're, they're zombified and you kind of don't know like were they always like this or were like the fingers at one point like pristine like yeah flesh-colored? <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah they, they are just I, yeah I mean, in that sense, like the three fingers looks more Attractive. as you would expect it to look. Like yes, it's, and, you know, it's just a volcanic thing. Yeah. yeah, and it's almost uh, more. It's also more attractive, isn't it? Like as a prospect, it's like, well, yeah. at least this is vital. It's something. It's something because it's yeah. actually like, like, like it's not just this lingering on. It's 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 essentially. Um, I mean, like, the whole thing with, like, though they who live in death is kind of, like, ironic for a universe that is in that undead state. <laughs> right, way, like, yeah, everyone lives in death, right? <laughs> yeah, like, fear is, like, the most honest of, of all of the, like, perpetuation endings, because that is the state of this world. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like, like, she kind of clouds it in this fog, and, and sort of, yeah, it's just sort of a world for the dead. Mm-hmm. But, like, yeah, like what that's else what could it that is world anyway, be? Right? <laughs> like, that's like, what, like it's, you... what it's heading towards anyway. Almost everyone you encounter is undead or dead. Yeah, and you go around killing all of these people, and then they're just back again, and then you yeah. kill them again, and, the... and that's not like 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 that's not like some kind of like meta thing. That's going on in the game, right? right? Like they are coming back. They are yeah, yeah. They are being like sort of 
churned out. Oh yeah, endlessly. it's not. I mean, that that's one of the really clever things. It's that Ludo narrative thing, isn't it? Where you know how enemies reset in video games because they have to. Well, yeah. here it's not just the enemies resetting it's them being resurrected yes. recycled through the same old patterns because that's what happens in this broken down system actually making like what has to be a feature of these games into the horror of these games is, right is, is clever really clever good. clever yeah. i mean that that is that is really damn clever i've got to say i love that it just it just evokes the innate horror of being a video game sprite yeah. right yes. <laughs> that you're endlessly recycled through the same patterns just to be killed by some random player and then resurrected again well, that's. A, I mean, there's just a general feature of of the FromSoft games that they will punish your expectations of video games. Yeah, like, generally, like even in the way that characters are set up. Like, like I mean, a really favorite example is um, Jer Ban, uh, the sort of like tomboyish um, jug girl you meet. Yeah, in the oh, village. she's great. She's brilliant. And, and she, like, in any other game, you'd be like, oh, she's kind of a comic really fun like side character and you'll get to have like an adventure with her or something and blah 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 like she just kind of feels like that character in any other game mm -hmm. but of course like she goes like you know she hero worships iron fist alexander with <laughs> you know it's the first hint that something is going mm -hmm. very very wrong mm -hmm. because um no alexander's um particular life choices are maybe not the most emulated yeah, i was gonna say you'd maybe not the best to be emulating and so you can, so like, have you finished her plus line? So basically, if you do, you can just, like, Alexander is dead, so you come mm -hmm. to her, and you can just set her on Alexander's path. She just leaves yeah. the village to, like, become the next Alexander. To become the next Alexander, yeah. So she is inevitably going to go mad in the same way, right? Yeah, like, exactly the same way. Like, yeah. <laughs> And like you get, you almost get the impression that that's what happened to Alexander. Yeah, right. Too. It's just this endless, endless loop that keeps happening and happening and happening. It's really grim. Yeah, and it's like, and, and that that whole thing of like the jar, the jarbird being like the most one of the cutest places yeah. in, in the thing, but also like what they are because they're sort of like dead they're, meat stuffed yes. into jars to animate them. that's what animates them isn't it they are filled with the dead the, the, the remains of dead heroes right mm. and then they're all um sealed with this this sort of the earth sea symbol and then you mm -hmm. find all of their corpses around the earth trees with their seals yeah. broken so like that's so like like are they just there to like transport this meat <laughs> to the trees for the that trees to feed seems on. to be the case doesn't it when you like when you encounter the roots of the earth trees in the dungeons and there's all the corpses twisted into them that seems to be what the purpose is to transport the dead to the trees mm. so which the is trees can feed on them and then ultimately the elden beast can feed on the trees and then mm -hmm. and then whatever outer god the elden beast <laughs> That basically the entire world is basically a feeding funnel to an outer god. Seems to be, yeah. I mean that 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 is definitely one of the implications of the game, and it's really quite yeah. grim. And the fact that they make the cutest creatures the like the most rudimentary part of that chain of <laughs> feeding the feeding the world to this yeah. universal being is kind of it's a it's a very um, typical, if disturbing, from soft movie. It's very uh, from soft. I've got to say, it is it, that that is just what they do in their video games. No, hardly anybody comes to a good end in from soft games. Um, but with that, Rowan, um, I'm yeah. going to have to skedaddle relatively soon. Um, before we go, do you have anything that you'd like to pimp out? Um, I'm not on twitter as much anymore but uh oh, you can put it in the description i can't yeah I absolutely fortune dot rowan or fortune rowan or something like that he like <laughs> rowan fortune into um twitter's search engine i don't think there's many of us so uh you'll probably find me uh <laughs> and i've usually got a pinned tweet with like the latest things uh i'm doing um sort of mostly um blog posts right now but there's sort of other stuff and and of course my website where i do freelance editing so of anyone course. who's looking for a freelance editor i'm uh, currently available and 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 can sort of help out with novels non-fiction yeah highly recommended by the way guys rowan um edited essential atrocities for me uh, it was a pleasure to work on that was 
it made it far more than it otherwise would have been it really did it was a, an enormous help so thank you so much for that um as for myself ladies and gents same as usual you can find me knocking about here on exaggerated elegy uh they're, they're still playing i'm uploading my elden ring videos to the elder to the uh, exaggerated elegy channel but they are coming to an end i'm nearly finished now so i'm uh, I, almost I 200 <laughs> <laughs> i'm, I'm I was really enjoying them, but then I've just been like so busy. And there's so when many you fall of them. behind. They're like, oh, yeah, they kind of. There escape. are so many. <laughs> so, don't, you know, no worries there. There are so many of the damn things. I didn't expect it to be this big. Um, but there we are. Uh, there are links to all of my uh, published fiction over at strangeplaygrounds.com. Uh, most recently had a short story published in um, the Book of Queer Saints, which you can find on Amazon co.uk and amazon.com um you can find the both volumes of uh born in blood short story collections over at perpetual motion machine publications.com and if you fancy coming to chat you can find me at enigmatic elegy on twitter uh Rowan, that was fantastic i mean we could we uh, this is it is that kind of subject isn't it we could have just oh, gone forever yeah with this yeah, one. Like, like like i don't think elden rings ring i always say rings for some reason <laughs> elden ring um uh ever really exhausts itself like it is just no. yeah like it's... there's just so much i mean we didn't even get into talking about like the locations for example no, like, like the... different yeah i mean a bit about uh lindell but like like um of course there's there's the hell of on earth place that you uh, oh. teleported to and, and like like well, this is not good. Um, right, what, what right. Is it called? The, the Red Desert. Kaled, yeah. Yeah, Kaled. Um, oh, my favorite area of the game. I love uh, uh, Crumbling Farah Missoula. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that wow. place done it. Wow. Like, 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 when you first go there, usually through that portal um, that yes. you can find um, in, in the Ray Alicaria area. Um, and and like you're like okay that was unexpected right. where am i <laughs> what what is this have i have i been transported to another time another is this the end of the world or, or what it's it's yeah it kind it's, of is the it, end of the world kind, kind of, of it is. It is. Like, yeah. yes yeah like it is just yeah that is that is an interesting place i, I remember <laughs> i when i first went there i posted a, a a thing on twitter which i think you and and kit responded to where i was like it, it, i think i i I posted a picture of like that that sort of vista of it with all the yeah. dragons and the cyclones and like interesting weather today or something. Like that. <laughs> uh, but, but it is um yeah it was like a, an absolute shock that yes. that that particular place. But so is Caleb. Like the fact mm -hmm. that they put a transporter trap in the first area <laughs> that takes you to Caleb <laughs> is such a bullshit Miyazaki yeah. move. It's so evil. It's you, really cruel. And it doesn't just take you to Caleb, it takes you to um that place with those centipede creatures mm -hmm. that just instant kill you. Like, yeah. like it it just takes you there to be oh, you you're playing this game and you're doing all right. You you feel like you you're you're mastering the, the challenges. Yeah. Well, this is what you can look forward to. <laughs> yeah. At the end of which is a fell star beast. Yes. It's, I mean it... you won't like that first time of going there, you will not get to the fell star. No, you piece. won't. You absolutely <laughs> won't. But it, it, it's it, it's it's a it's a, it's a son of a bitch move, isn't it? It's a really yeah. cruel thing to do, but very Miyazaki, as you say, yeah. very Miyazaki. But no, thank you so much. I mean, I know we've been we've been wanting to chat about Elden Ring for such a long time, but it's taken me quite a while to get through it. <laughs> no, I think mean, yeah, like I I had like a period of of downtime and mm -hmm. as I say 317 hours yeah. or whatever it was 300 plus hours like <sighs> I, I I did decide like after my like second and a half I actually had like loads of little playthroughs where I didn't get mm -hmm. very far I was just testing out character sites and then yeah. like second and a half playthrough I was like if I play through this again I will lose my entire existence I am uninstalling <laughs> this game yeah um I will eventually I mean obviously I'll reinstall it when they release a, a, a um Oh, a, uh, yeah. a DLC or a DLC, patch or yeah. something. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's um, it, it's an it's a bit of a life eater. This one, isn't it? It yeah. is a bit of a life eater. And once I once I finished with this playthrough, I'm going to have a break because I want to do something else. I want to do, uh, maybe like you know something a bit more one shot, like a horror game or something mm -hmm. to that effect. Um, something a bit more contained. Something uh, like a, a like like a kind of like walking 
um, simulator horror yes, game would be like a something good like that. that. Yeah, I mean, there's a game on uh, called Madison that I'd love to have a go at. That mm-hmm. looks good. Do you have a VR unit, by the way? Uh, I do, actually. Yeah, I do have a VR helmet. Do, do you know that? Um, oh, what's the 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 horror VR uh, the, the horror uh, walking simulator game you you played quite a lot? Um, you played sort of the the different um, iterations of it. You mentioned it in in this conversation. Oh, Layers earlier. of Fear. Layers of Fear. There is a. I think there's. Let me just check. I think there's a Layers of Fear VR game. If there you can is, that. I um, I don't. That know is about sounds that. terrifying. I, but I like... honestly don't know. I mean, I I, I I've played Resi Seven on VR, and that was terrifying. And that was a Resident Evil game. I mean, that that was horrific. <laughs> I feel like Layers of Fear, yeah, it's the first one as well, which is one of the more horrific. It, it really is. I, I'm um, not sure I can cope with that, if I'm perfectly honest. That that might do for me. I've had it on like my wish list, and I keep like, going back and forth on it. Like, am I even going to play it? Is it going to be too much? Am I just going to feel sick? Well, I'll um, be honest, that Resi 7, when I was playing that on VR, that scared me witless. Yeah. It, it, it was... It was a unique horror experience i've never experienced anything like it there was something about the vr that turned off the part of my brain that that insisted this was a video game yeah and it felt like real fear it felt like i was panicking it felt like i was having like anxiety and it was like oh no i I, mm, no Mm. i can't actually deal with this so something like layers of fear which is much more disturbing disturbing. yeah Yeah. i'm not sure i could deal with that i'll I'll give it a go a fascinating let's play (laughs) yeah probably not very long (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> just it just starts and, and, and you scream continuously yeah, and then I'll it just, ends yeah, <laughs> no, the only other game i could think of that's ever affected me like that is visage mm. that terrified me visage i found really hard to get through because it was really unpleasant it was just just a disturbing horrible game really good i mean really amazing for what it did for what it was trying to do very successful but i'm not sure i would ever play that again because it, it really scared me it got to me that did i'm in a mood for like a game like that like a hurry i mean i've got a whole bunch that i've got sort of on the um sort of backpedal that i just don't have enough time for ever <laughs> um, but i'm in a, a, a real mood for like a really good horror game i, like I would that. recommend yeah. visage i would only recommend playing it once because it yes. it it's it's really unpleasant i mean it, it really did scare me there are moments in that i mean if you watch the very first video of my let's play on that it only lasts for like 20 minutes and at the end i actually do i you, you can hear in my voice that i'm going and it, i actually say you know what guys i i can't deal with this at the moment so i'm gonna cut it here i did it, i did watch your let's play but i watched it in a very fragmented way it was always <laughs> like yeah like the imagery and 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 ideas that i saw were disturbing yeah i said that the domesticity like horror mixed yes. domesticity is is always, it's always really a winner active, right like, it's always yeah. a winner i mean th- what makes visage so successful is not only it, amazing atmosphere which is really oppressive and horrible but also it misdirects you mm. so one of the earliest scares in the game you're wandering through the house and you hear what sounds like very soft footsteps in the attic so you're looking up you're looking up as you're on the landing of the house and as out of the corner of your eye at the foot of the stairs, you see a figure and it just moves away down the corridor. And that's not where you're looking. So it's just out of the corner of the eye. It's really effective and horrible. And ah, just, just it sends shivers Mm. up my spine, even thinking about experiencing that game. It's really unpleasant, but very, very good. I mean, any game that like, can control your attention in that way is is doing something i mean any horror that can control your Mm. attention in that way like that that is i think the art of of writing a good horror like oh yeah and using misdirection in that way is phenomenally clever you don't get much horror that actually does that i you know i think like there's, there's a kind of like anti um jump scare which i completely get because it's overused and often badly used Mm -hmm. but the art of doing a really good jump scare oh it's amazing like misdirecting your audience and setting them up for it in a way that like 
that there, there is an artistry for it that then can be applied to other aspects of horror, like even thematic yeah. aspects of horror. You know, like you can you can sort of yeah. I I, I I'm a kind of defender of the jump sky. Just think <laughs> it's usually done. Bad, it's usually done like, badly. No, I mean, jump yeah. scares can be amazing. They can be so effective, but they've got to be earned and they've got to be done well. Um, it's all timing, isn't it? The jump scares are all about timing. And yeah. some of them in this game are phenomenal. I mean, there's one on one of the videos where I literally scream. I actually do scream. It does really get to me. I was in the, there's an office upstairs and I, I can't even remember what I was doing. I was just wandering around in there and I happened to turn and look out of the door in, onto the landing and just around the corner, I just saw like the top half of a face and fingers disappearing as they were peering around the, and I just lose it. <laughs> it, it, like that is like exactly what you want from a good horror game yeah I, I, a question H- how much would it cost you uh how much would you, you would demand someone pay to get you to play a vr version of visage <laughs> it, uh... <laughs> No, I mean that for my own. No health, price. <laughs> that for my own health, that'd be a no because it, it would be it would really that really would be like, yeah messed up yeah it would actually require therapy after I would actually have to have some sort of treatment after because it is and this is one of the reasons why like most of the VR games I get I play are like like I got like lots of ones that are like art plunge and infinite yeah. art museum and like you just go around seeing like famous works of art in different ways or there's one where you can like literally go inside of famous paintings that reading. sounds lovely art plunge I, i'd recommend it. it's a very small little game it, you know you can finish you well, finish it like you just go into paintings but but like you know you can experience the entire thing in four <laughs> minutes if you want to um and it's not really a game as such but it's, no, it's, it's a great an piece experience of, yeah. right I mean, but, it's it's um, just it's really good. Yeah, the very yeah. notion, the very notion of visage on VR is is almost <laughs> verging on the the, the blasphemous. It's, it's, I can't even. There are certain things that, like in it that I'm thinking of now that I'm sure would harm people mm. if it were like like give you like literally give you a heart attack or something. VR can be creepy and disturbing even when it isn't meaning to be. Like there's yes, something about yes. like the irreality of it um yeah. it's an uncanny like, like, effect isn't it yeah like even like playing games like like half-life alex which is not like which is a great vr game and it's not designed mm-hmm. at all to be scary like there are moments where it does get too much just yeah. like the f- the intensity of it i guess mm-hmm. um yeah it is an interesting medium like i think we've kind of just seen the beginnings of it still oh yeah i I think it could potentially be amazing i mean as it currently stands it is tailor-made for horror it's tailor-made for horror because it it does create this immersion where the experience is so intense and visceral that I, i i would honestly say i've never experienced anything quite like it in horror before Mm. Um, that feeling of genuinely not wanting to go down the corridor of genuinely not wanting to open the door because you don't know what's going to be behind it and how it's going to affect you. I mean, I, I, I remember I, I have, uh, some friends who have the VR helmet and we were playing Resi seven through together, um, at their house. And I had to stop. Mm. I just had to stop. It was, it was, it was causing me physical pain. I was like, my heart was, was racing. Uh, my, my limbs were all bunched up and my joints were all tense. And it took me a while after taking the VR helmet off to, to get over it, to recover properly. Mm. My friend, my friend Ray, uh, he put just, just put on the VR helmet once to look around like the main hallway. And he was in there for a minute looking around and he just went, Nope. And took it off. And that was it. <laughs> that that is understandable like it is it is an experience like i think like yeah i've I've had i've like tried it out on friends and and, and mostly with things like art plunge and stuff art mm. plunge is a good one to introduce people to vr because it's so sort of laid back but even art plunge like people kind of feel like like they'll be in one of the famous like botticelli paintings of like, just like the way that the the woman was looking at somebody or something yeah. like, like it just felt too intense like it was just yes like there is an intensity to I guess any kind of like like art that 
like games are already hyper immersive any kind of art that is going beyond even games in the level mm-hmm. of immersion that are that are like in sort of in camp in sort of in capturing you in sound in a sound in a in a in a in a reality like that um it's a lot yeah it's a lot it, to it take is, in like yeah, on a sensory yeah. level isn't it there's almost like an overload that happens i find i just can't take it for very long um, not the, designed well it can even be quite like sickening in the vertigo yeah. where like I, I love this game hellblade um <laughs> which is which is a quite disturbing vr game i tend to play it non-vr now and i need to finish it on the non-vr thing but the way that the camera moves with the vr um in like really like quick like a third person vr is already a bit weird mm-hmm. um but the way that the camera sometimes spins with with the character's movement just immediately makes me seasick like, yes it's just like, like, <laughs> like, I'm like i can i could only like play it in like five minute goes which doesn't really work with the kind of game it is um, no and that that is one of the big problems with vr at the moment isn't it a lot of people actually can't play it at all because it does mm-hmm. make them sick I think I think third person is a mistake in VR. To be honest, like I think that like that is like just calculated to make you feel to make you vomit, yeah. basically yes. to make you feel nauseous and dizzy and just yeah, not good, mm. not good at all. Well, I've got to I'm going to skedaddle around because I've got yeah, to, yeah, I've got to go and uh, have a nap. I think. Um, mm. Thank you so so much. And I, once again, I, I, when Lex is available, we'll, we'll throw. Um, we're we going to do at the Mountains of Madness. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. It's probably good that we didn't do it now because I didn't actually have time to reread. <laughs> <it. laughs> and that um, is one you yeah. need to reread because it's yeah big, definitely it's dense. I mean, if we can get uh, Jim McLeod on as well. I mean, I've been talking. Mm about doing um at the mountains of madness with jim for a long time but we've just never managed to accord but if we can if we can throw that together that'd be amazing um but if there's anything you'd like to do in between now and then or or whenever just please hit me up and let me know and we'll uh, we'll sit down and have a chat absolutely i mean you know me i can always find a topic to talk for four or five hours about brilliant. So, absolutely brilliant yeah. well well as i say let me know and we'll uh we'll have a go yeah excellent thank you as always it's no, been always a pleasure wonderful. always a pleasure thank you so so much